Okay, I am recording and we are live. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Newburyport Historical Commission meeting for the 14th of January 2021 in yet another Zoom virtual meeting. Um, Present, we have, uh, let's see, uh, let's do a little roll call here. I, I see Patricia Pecknick, here. Vice Chair. Uh, Joe Morgan. Here. Uh, P Patrick McNamee. Peter. I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Peter McNamee, um, who I is muted right now, but I see him, so he's here. Uh, Christopher Fay. Here. Uh, Caitlin Sullivan Planner is also on the line and Malcolm Conrath is uh, dialing in as we speak and hopefully will be joining us shortly. Um, so uh, I've got some things to go over while we're trying to get him on board here. Um, the, uh, and let's see, do I have our, um, uh, yep, we have our minute taker uh, listening in as well. So we're, and let's see, a number of uh, members of the public. So let's get started without delay. It may go a little long, so let's get going. Um, as per, you, most of you are familiar with these rules already. It is a Zoom meeting. Um, only the commissioners, that is the members of the panel, will be audio enabled all the time. Um, it, we will have public comment period, uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand. You can find the control for that in the Zoom uh, conference um, application. It's usually a little icon or something that says raise hand. And um, if you're on the phone, you can use star nine to raise a hand and star six to unmute yourself. Um, during some uh, deliberations, we might also want to use the raise hand um, functionality for a panelist too, if things get uh, too, you know, if we get carried away, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and uh, as with any public meeting, if you are making a statement, uh, please identify yourself, your name and address um, as that uh, standard procedure for public meetings and public hearings. And also for the commissioners, if you're making a motion, um, please state your, or seconding it and just state your name as well. Uh, so that uh, the minute taker can have that information. And all our, all our votes will be roll call votes uh, for these Zoom meetings. I think that's it for my preambulatory remarks. Let's see if we got nine, four, eight. Did we get, um, Caitlin, did we get uh, Malcolm on board? We did, I see him and I have unmuted him. Oh, okay, so is it, is it possible to promote someone who's on the phone to a panelist or is that not doable? It is not, but he should be able to see the screen and he can yep. um, speak if you would okay. like to. So Malcolm, if you can hear me, presumably you can, try unmuting yourself if you're mu locally muted. So we just want to make sure we can hear you okay. Not hearing you, Malcolm. Um, you may have to hit uh, was it star six to unmute yourself? Is that what I said? Yeah, star six. Uh, try that because if we can't hear you, and obviously we, we can't consider you as attending the meeting. But we have one, two, three, four, five members, but we do have a quorum. All right, well, I'll try a little longer, but for now we'll assume that uh, He's not an active uh, participant. The first item on our agenda is one that has been around for a while, I think approximately a year now. Uh, this is 93 State Street, otherwise known as the Institution for Savings. Um, they have um, come up with a new iteration of their proposed plans. Um, uh, will Attorney Mead be speaking on behalf of that applicant? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, this is Lisa Mead. Um, Mead, did you want to finish something? Or? Yeah, just one thought. Uh, so my, my understanding, and, and I'll give you the floor in just a second, uh, Attorney Mead, uh, my, I just want to confirm, my understanding is that you will uh, want, or uh, the planning board, I think, is going to want uh, an updated uh, advisory report um, 
so just uh, confirm with me if that's you know what your expectation is basically out of uh, tonight's get you know meeting and then I'll uh, in, you can turn, have, turn over the floor and I believe Caitlin is presenting your uh, present you know sh vi the video display has your presentation as we speak. Um, yes, Mr. Chair, um, that is correct. So just for the record, Lisa Mead, Mead Tellum Costa 30 Green Street on behalf of the Institution for Savings. Um, and we are here for a DOD review, um, which comes with it um, a recommendation or at least comments from this commission to the planning board for the DOD special permit, which is under consideration by the planning board. Um, and uh, happy new year to everyone. Uh, as the chair said, we have been doing this for about a year. Um, with me this evening is Mike Jones, who is the CEO of the bank, Kim Rock, the COO of the bank, uh, Christopher Angelakis, who is the architect. Uh, with him is Joanne Zhang, who is also part of ARC um, Architects, and Judith Selwyn, uh, of course, the um, architectural historian. Um, we are here for an advisory review. Um, and Caitlin, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and the next one after that. So what we're gonna to present to you tonight are the changes we've made in the plan. Uh, I'm going to briefly go over um, specifically what some of those changes are. And then Christopher is gonna walk you through uh, the plans. We have uh, his model plans uh, pointing out some of the differences. And then we also have renderings. Um, so in light of the commission's prior comments and those comments of the planning board, uh, the bank has again undertaken a significant and complete redesign of the proposed addition. Specifically, they've decreased the usable square footage from 7,712 square feet to 6,512. They've removed all program space from the first floor and a reduction of program space on the second floor as a result. They've removed the hallway on the first floor. They've removed the loge overhang entry on the State Street side. Uh, the new design features include a new uh, return to the brick facade to complement the existing structure, an increased number of windows on the Prospect Street facade to better complement the smaller proportioning of the buildings. A hip roof design was employed to decrease the overall height and massing, including the use of slate shingles. There's wood trim and copper cornice, which we'll, uh, Christopher will go over with you. A mixture of masonry trim features, including two types of bricks that delineate the facades and break up the massing, a mixture of granite, limestone, and base, lintel sills, uh, and the areas above the garage doors and aluminum clad windows. So specifically, um, the building had a, has a reduced footprint, and as a result of that, an increased setback in a number of areas. So there's an increased setback um, on uh, Prospect Street. It was originally in our last proposal from zero to 1.6 feet, and it's now uh, between uh, five and six feet along uh, Prospect Street. The Otis Place side has a reduced um, setback. It was originally uh, zero to three feet in places, and now it's nine feet, nine inches to 24 feet, seven inches. So there's a significant setback on Otis Place. And on the side that uh, separates for Otis Place from the building, it originally was five feet, 10 inches separation. Now we've pulled it back to seven feet, seven inches. The design change in the building also results in a height, lower height comparison. Um, the ridge height most significantly, the proposed ridge is at 33 uh, feet, three inches. The 1870 building has a ridge of 33 feet, 11 inches. 11 to 13 Prospect, which are those three major buildings along Prospect Street, are 37, three inches. And uh, there's a structure on Otis that you'll see in the plans that we're gonna present at 32 feet, six inches. The eave height is 24, six. The 1870 building has an eave height of 30 feet, eight inches. Uh, and 11 to 13 Prospect has an eave height of 23 feet, six inches. And that selected structure on Otis has an eave height of 21 feet, seven inches. The mean on the proposed building is 2811. The mean on the 1870 building is 32, two and a half. The mean on 11 to 13 Prospect Street is 30 feet, six inches. And the mean on that structure on Otis is 37, 27 feet and a half inches. So all of the foregoing dimensional comparisons show the proposed addition will be subservient to the existing structure, both by distance and location on the lot, as well as dimension. Further dimensional comparisons expose that the building is compatible 
with the portion of property that is surrounded by residential structures. After Christopher reviews the plans with you, we think that you'll be able to see that given the reduction in size, location and setbacks, as well as the roof design, that you'll be able to determine that the building does not detract, but is compatible with the historic scale and character of the historic structure and setting within the DOD. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher to review the changes. Hi, thank you very much. Um... So the way we've set up this presentation is, you can start with the slide four, sure. Um, and the way we've set up the presentation is actually go through the previous scheme. So every slide we have here, um, the previous scheme is paired with the new scheme. So we can be very explicit about the changes that are made. And we're also in this first part of the presentation labeling some of the dimensional properties that, that Lisa just um, went through. Um, that is just to make clear um, exactly what dimensions we're giving. Um, so uh, you can click to number five. So the so here we're seeing what the current um, setbacks were um, of the previous, and those are things that um, Attorney Mead just went through. If you click to six, here we could see how the project steps back um, very significantly on Otis Place. So um, up to 24 feet um, at the corner, um, and then. Uh, the setback at Prospect Street really sits back to five foot six. The design changes to all of this before we go further are actually a result of, of listening very deeply to a lot of things that were said um, specifically by the neighborhood in, in what things they, they seem to value the most. And what we heard and what we reacted to was setbacks and height. And um, in scale, of course, has always been in play and we've continued to try to um, have this building um, approach the scale of the, of the neighborhood, but, um, but now setting back in a, in a way that's actually more indicative of, of commercial properties around the city. So we continue to click through these. We can go through probably pretty quickly. The previous in slide eight really points out that the relationship of the eave height from from the previous scheme to this, uh, to the other side of the street. And then the next slide um, is only to be very uh, transparent about the fact that the eave height has not changed on this uh, proposal, but is the same, but you can very much see that the change in, in roof, uh, roof design has a very big uh, impact on mass. And we'll get to that a little bit further into the presentation. Number 10. Essentially, uh, just has the same piece of information, but I think it's important to look at it from a, from um, down the other direction too. So we we were actually looking straight down Prospect Street here, as if you were standing in the middle of the road. And if you click through, you can see the change in massing. Um, pardon the interruption, but is it? It's not an illusion, but it's it. It looks like the or uh, pitch of the roof uh, is less. Yes, we did two. We did two things. We lowered the pitch and we made it a hip. And so both of those take the apparent mass of the building way down. So we were looking around the neighborhood for precedents as well. Uh, there are a number of buildings in the neighborhood that have uh, that have uh, pitch roof. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, hip hip roofs. So we did not, in, including the uh, the 1870 one building. So click to in succession 12 and 13. So 12, this actually shows where we were in the previous with the, uh, with the setback, uh, the rear yard setback. And we actually, um, it, what we actually did was pull this back out about a foot and a half away from that setback. So if you can click back to 12, you can toggle and see. And here it's a little harder to tell because the massing of the building has changed uh, apparent massing has changed so much and we're actually setting back so much further on, on Otis Place, but there is another foot and a half that we've set back off the it, rear yard. It, um, just also to clarify, so you're saying in addition to the setback from Otis Place, is there an additional setback uh, between your structure and that uh, that Gambrell roof house next Yes, to so the whole property line uh, that's considered rear rear yard setback right. has has there's an additional 
foot and a half that oh, we see pulled off of that. So okay. it went from five foot set back off that property line to seven and a half. And because the building doesn't isn't parallel to almost any of the property lines, there's there's always a range. So at the yep. in that one, we've given the, the the closest we ever get to the furthest. So okay. seven foot Thank one you. to seven foot seven. Um, and that, that, those are just the views that we chose to kind of describe some of the dimensional changes that happen. But the next series of slides are ones that you're all familiar with, even though we've paired them with the previous to the new, just so we can actually walk through all of the views that are familiar to everyone and see how the massing has changed from the previous scheme that was presented to this one. So this was the previous scheme um, with the, with the, um, gable roof and then the click through to the next scheme with and, and you can see how that can click through the other thing that you're noticing as we're walking down prospect street yeah you can keep clicking through kind of what you're noticing is that the the mass that is actually uh on prospect street if you can just hold here for a second the actual mass of that of the brick uh, volume that you're seeing is actually thinner too. If you toggle back to 21, you can see the difference in the apparent width of the mass that was on Prospect Street to this one. And this, this had to do with some, some technical things, but also very much caring about how putting the smaller scale elements on the street. And you can start clicking through to 23. In 24, you notice that the porch element or loggia element has come off. Uh, there's no longer occupied space any, any longer down on the ground floor. So there's no longer sort of an entry condition that happens. This is the Garden Street side. We can click through this very quickly. Um, not much has changed other than the, the profile of the roof you can see comes down. Now, I think it's worth holding on these next few slides a little bit. One of the things we've very much tried to do was figure out how to work the program to, um, if you click back to 29, please. You can see in the previous scheme, yeah, that's fine. The previous scheme here was sitting very close to Otis Street property line, but when we clicked the 30, setting back and very much creating a street wall with the adjacent house and really trying to um, look at window spacing, window proportions um, to have more of a dialogue with this, this particular house, which is, which is unique in, in its size and its detailing and actually quite a ch challenge to build next to for, for any, anybody. But that's one of our, um, we put a lot of effort into, into setting back and really clearing um, that corner, so to speak. And we can click to 31. And this is a view that everyone's very familiar with, looking back down Prospect Street and click to 32. And here the scale change is quite apparent. And it's worth maybe toggling back one more time to 31 and then to 32. The changing of the gable roof and pulling the one story off the corner and allowing us to set back the whole building, um, we think has a very big shift in scale here. And then the next two slides really are details of the facade. I, I think last time we met, um, people were very interested in seeing how it approached the street. And here it's very apparent that the, the number of windows on this facade has increased. That's to sort of deal with the, you know, the solid to void ratio. We very, looked very carefully at the window uh, proportions and sizes um, at this on this scheme, and also the seeing the lands, landscape buffer. Um, as we are able to set back here. And then in the next two slides are ones that we're all familiar with, which, is the, <clears throat> which are the aerials. And it really shows what the, what the massing manipulations were to, uh, to achieve what, what we've come back with. As you can see, the material, materiality of it, um, yeah, you can go on to 27 and 28. The materiality of it is, is um, brick to match the 1980s building on, on uh, as we attach, um, we are proposing a potentially uh, different color, maybe darker brick towards the Prospect Street side that is there to enhance the sort of separation of these masses. The spaces in between these particular brick masses uh, are proposed to be 
uh, stone, uh, limestone uh, lintels, sills, and limestone in infills, and the whole building being set on a granite base. Um, the cornice is uh, being proposed to be uh, copper and a slate shingle roof. And then that goes through our, our, our views. Another quick interruption. It looks like, uh, are the brick, uh, the Prospect Street side, the brick looks a little darker than the one further in Otis Place. Is that correct or is that just an illusion? Yeah, I was just referring to that. Um, the brick on the on the kind of rear lot side would, would match the 1980s building. I see. And the brick on the Prospect Street side, we are proposing to be a slightly darker mm -hmm. okay. brick color to help separate the kind of massing, you know, we're trying mm -hmm. to separate visually the masses to uh -huh. have them feel like separate uh, masses. And so the change in color and potentially the change in, in uh, in coursing uh, mm -hmm. is a tool that we can use to, to do that. Yep. Okay. So if you could go to the renderings, um, please. <clears throat> there you go, Christopher. Right, and so this is this is gonna take you through a number of the same views we just saw, but these are much more photorealistic. So, so instead of being a more technical drawing, these are placed a little bit more in context. So, um, Again, uh, th th this is how it feels from State Street, and there's there's a lot of foliage in the way. In the winter, it might be a, <clears throat> a bit more apparent, but you can click to number two. Number two starts to give you a sense of how bringing the, the gable to a hip starts to affect the massing. And three. Three is just stepping up a bit closer in the relationship of the 80s building to this building in the separation we're trying to design in uh, between the two masses. And four is a little bit of more of a facade detail. And five takes us back to look into sort of the turnaround. This is a little bit of an elevated view, sort of a second floor view from, a, from across the way. And six. Six, the Otis Place view. And again, you can see that there, in, even in this rendering, there is a kind of separation of brick color between the two masses. And seven. And again, highlighting the relationship of the, the facade to the adjacent buildings. I notice you still have the chimney. Is it, is it still gonna be functional? Uh, yes, it'll be functional on the second floor. Ah, uh, second floor, okay. Yes. Indeed. So I think um, what's a couple of things I wanna just highlight, uh, if you could go back to slide seven for a moment. Um, one of the things that um, we really worked on was a the the massing of the building and the the hip roof, but in particular in this view, given the setback on Otis, uh, with the creation of the green space um, there, you'll see the exposure to four Otis um, that now exposes that house uh, and the bay window in front down the street. Notwithstanding, there are no uh, windows on that side of the house except for in the rear, on the rear back corner on that side. So. Um, we think it exposes the street and it doesn't overwhelm this corner. That was something that Christopher uh, worked on a lot. Um, and then similarly, um, the uh, what the aerial photos would show you, um, and I, I don't know if you can go back to the previous presentation, um, Caitlin, and go back to slide 27, perhaps. Um, No, one of the aerials, I think is the second to the last. I'm sorry, I didn't, I couldn't see the, right there, there you go. I think that um, one of the things that's really important, uh, go to the next one, please, is that um, you see the massing of, uh, and the roof size um, and the width of the buildings on the left-hand side of Prospect Street, the major contributing buildings on that side, 
versus what's now been broken down in the size and height of the uh, massing on the buildings on the new proposed structure. And there was a lot of work to bring those down and bring it in. Um, and we think that uh, as a result, it both fits in with the bank itself, given its location on the lot, and then the neighborhood, as I've just exposed on the, uh, the Otis Street view. So um, with that, I don't know if you want to go back to the uh, renderings, Caitlin, to that, and I think we'll um, take questions um, from the board. I one quick and I had, um, did you guys have a chance to do re or redo, I should say, the uh, shadow studies? Um, we haven't had a chance to redo those. We thought that we would do that um, for the planning board. Mm -hmm. um, the bank, the building is, the roof pitch is different, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, the E height is the same. And of course it's pulled back from the street. Right. So um, I don't believe it will, there will be a, you know, any greater impact on shadows. My my thought is it's going to be less, but we haven't had a chance to finish those. Yeah, I would I would expect that it would be improved. Right. Okay. Well, let me. Uh, uh, we'll allow public comment on this, but before I turn it open that uh, section, let me see if any. I see a couple hands up on the board. So let me turn first to uh, Peter McNamee. Your hand is up. Did you want to make a ask a question or something? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Just uh, again, I'm going sure. to refuse my. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yep, yeah, uh, just FYI, everyone, that Peter is uh, a, a nearby neighbor and uh, throughout this, uh, the course of this particular project has been recusing himself. Thank you, Peter, for reminding me of that. Um, uh, Patricia Pecknick, did you have uh, something to ask or say? I have two quick questions. In the sure. height comparison, it mentions uh, Otis Place selected structure. And I'm wondering if that's number five Otis Place. And my second question is, was removing the loggia, is or is that uh, contribute to the calculation of subtracting usable space? So um, I think we're gonna need to go back to the, um, there we go. And up towards the beginning. Probably number three. Yeah, I was wondering about that too, that that uh, selected structure, if right. that was... Uh, so I think it's um, slide, yeah. uh, maybe it's five. I, I concluded that it was five from looking. I just wanted to see. No, I was, I was talking about slide five. It's oh, I thought it was number five, Otis. I wasn't sure if, is it this I'm gonna, house or no? I'm gonna let um, Christopher answer that question. I just, I don't think we're on the right slide. Okay. Um, the setback slide. So you want to go a couple more, Caitlin, please keep going. Yeah, I don't think we call it out in these these three Ds because you never see it. I believe I believe the board member is probably correct, but I I, I can't say right now which one okay. by by address it is. Okay. I, I do believe it's the one here on the on the corner. Oh, on the corner. Okay, thank you. I think so. I think so. And my other question is just the loja did that. Uh, yeah, that does not contribute to square footage. Yeah. No, it, it, it did not. That did not affect the square footage calculation at all. Thank you. Yes. So, that, so that selected prop uh, address is not the Gambrel uh, roof. That's the abutter there, direct abutter in the back. I, you know, I would like to. I would like to be able to get back to you with that answer okay. because okay. it's. You know, we didn't record it here, and yep. I, I don't okay. want to give you an answer that's wrong. Sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands among my board. So um, I will open a public comment period. So again, I'll refer, remind people, uh, if you do want to make a public comment, please keep it brief. Uh, I've really I've had a, a bad week, so I really would rather not have an, another very late night. Uh, and give your name and address, please. And if someone, a, if a previous person has already pretty much said what you want to say, uh, you can, you know, try to find a way of either lowering a hand or saying what he said. Okay, with that, um, I see Peter Mackin has a hand up. Um, so looks like you've been enabled. Uh, you will have to locally unmute yourself as well when we enable you. Okay, so, this is Pete Mackin. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm at 13 Prospect Street. Um, I would say it's still a large, a two-story building, 
but this proposal is much better than the prior proposals. The bank has made a number of positive changes. And in our minds, it's uh, now more architecturally compatible with the existing buildings. The brick construction, uh, the roof line, uh, the setback on the corner of Prospect and Otis are all major improvements. Um, I do have two other points. One is a clarification question with regard to setback on Prospect. Currently, the sidewalk on Prospect is six foot wide. Is the distance to the curb from the building um, on Prospect five foot five feet or is it 11 and a half feet? Sounds like you're asking if it includes the sidewalk. Correct. <clears throat> or not. No. Okay. I'm going to, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So um, it does not include the sidewalk. Um, so the board has the site plans. Uh, the sidewalk is to the property line. Okay. So the property line to the building is five, five and a half feet. That's correct. Wonderful. And five, feet uh, five at one end and five feet seven at the other. Okay, and the other uh, comment was in currently and uh, in many of the earlier proposals, there is lighting at both sides of uh, on prospect, both sides of the building that you're proposing. Um, I don't see a, any lighting on the Otis Street side uh, of the new proposal. Do you plan lighting over in that, uh, that corner? Um, I believe that on the uh, plans, there is a light at the door that would operate only when the door opens and closes that emergency exit door. Um, but I, I am, um, I'm going to flip through the plans while you're, we're taking other questions and I'll make sure I answer that question properly. Okay, thank you. I think that it's important to have light there in the in uh, some light in the evening because of uh just safety purposes there is a um there's a street light right there on the corner okay um so as you obviously you live there you know that so um there is a we, we actually looked at that street light to make sure that there was lighting back there okay that's all my comments thank you very much okay thank you mr mackin um is there any other member of the public who would like to make a comment at this point? I'm not seeing a hand, um, but I'll give it a few seconds to see if someone would like to <coughs> raise it and make a comment. <laughs> I should be thankful that we don't have an extended thing, but... Uh... Caitlin, uh, you don't see any hands raised either, do you? Oh, wait, there's son, yep. Mr. Uh, Pollock, um, we see your hand. Did you want to make a comment? Uh, you have to unmute yourself locally. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Richard Pollock from uh, um, five and seven, one and three, five and seven Garden Street. Um, I was wondering what the back wall looks like that's facing my property, my backyard. Uh, is there going to be windows in it? Or is it just a solid brick wall? Um, is it going to be open to the garage? And Etc. Um, Mr. Chair, um, perhaps uh, Caitlin, you could take us back to the model for a minute. It will have windows just like the Prospect Street side. And um, we do have a view of that Garden Street side that we showed. Um, so it has windows and brick and it's broken up just like the Prospect Street side. So if you can slide down a little bit, um, Caitlin. It sounds like you're saying, uh, Ms. Mead, that uh, it it's, looks very similar to the Prospect Street side. That is correct. So yeah. there'll, there'll be closed windows on the closed windows on the garage side. Then basically, yeah. we won't get all the fumes from the garage. I guess that's nope. what I was concerned about in the backyard. No. Okay. And my other no, comment, yeah, the, you know, my other comments are, you know, it's it's very improved from the from the original designs, but it's still very massive to be set in the neighborhood. You know, if, if we saw this the first thing without the original designs, we would we say, boy, that's a, that's just a massive structure to be put into a historical neighborhood. Um, I know it's smaller than the original, but it's still massive. And I don't know how it fits with the historical nature of the, of the neighborhood. You know, it's not like the other properties that are in the neighborhood. That's my comment. 
Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Um, and uh, please uh, put your hand down when you're done. Um, I see a Clara Papanastasio. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'd like to echo Peter Mackin's, Mackin's comments as well as Richard's uh, Pollock's to a degree, but I do wanna say that this design is much better and um, on a larger level and a bigger level, very gratified to hear to see that the process is working in terms of hearing the feedback from the neighborhood and the roles of the historical commission and all that. So we've seen improvement and uh, very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I see a Paula Renda. Well, let's see if we can get you enabled. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I don't see an audio icon. Okay, there you go. You're you are now enabled on our side. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, I would like to mimic the past two, three speakers. Um, although there are several improvements, and I, like Claire, appreciate the process and um, am thankful that the bank is responding and hearing us. Um, however, I do still feel it's a massive structure for this neighborhood. And that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll give it a few seconds, see if there are any other hands. Caitlin, do you see any other hands? I do not. All right then, I'll officially close the public comment period and we can have some discussion among the board. Oh, Mr. Chair, there is one more right uh -oh. here. Just popped up. Hmm, shall I exercise my phenomenal cosmic power to reopen the public comment period? Well, okay, just for this one, Robert, okay, we'll, we'll uh, temporarily briefly reopen public comment period to allow uh, Robert to speak. I just have the first name. Uh, you should, we should be able to hear you now. Hi, it's Sandra Nogler, 11 Prospect Street. I concur with the last woman's comments and I see a lot of improvement on the Otis Place, um, but not too much on the Prospects Street side of the building. Um, I feel that you've made a significant improvement, but it, in my opinion, it is not an improvement enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now uh, we will close the public uh, comment period. Um, so turning to the board, um, would, would someone like to um, react, ask a question, make a comment, voice an opinion? Okay, Mr. Morgan, what would you like to say? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, certainly agree with all of the neighbors, the abutters, um, that there's been a tremendous amount of work done and it's uh, reduced the perceived mass of the uh, structure. I think it's actually a very, starting to be a very uh, refined, um, compact little structure. And I, 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 I think that uh, the setbacks have really helped to sort of decompress the, um, its relationship to the street, even though the eave has not uh, been reduced. Um, Unfortunately, as much as we, we you know, the, it has, it's responding to uh, the comments of the neighborhood, and I think that that might be paramount, um, it has not at all responded, as far as I can tell, it's taken steps backward in terms of its historical um, uh, relationship to the neighborhood. And, you know, I, I feel that the, we've, we've lost some information here from our numerous discussions on this last year, maybe 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 we've forgotten because we just haven't met for so long. But there there is there is a the the Secretary of the Interior Standards requires that the structure responds to its historical context in terms of materials and scale. And by um, introducing brick again. You've taken a step back in introducing lower pitch roofs that do not respond 
to the, the immediate vernacular, the, the immediate historical context, you've taken a step backward. So I just don't know where this is going, but in terms of what we have to decide on the historical commission, if the, historic, if the Secretary of the Interior standards are to be taken seriously and applied, this is going the wrong way. So forgive me, I like to compliment the architect's design, compliment the, um, the work that's been done and its response to the neighborhood comments, but from, the, from, from my perspective as being a commissioner, uh, speaking about the, the, the historical contextual issues, this is not doing it. This is going the wrong way. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Joe. Um, well, uh, let me ask a question. Actually, Caitlin, there's a, let me see if there's one that will show this. On the, on the roof pitch aspect, um, why don't you go to slide 11, uh, Caitlin? Um, the, and this is a question for the architect, I suppose. Uh, it's true that most of those, like we don't see in this view any hip roofs. Um, they're all standard gable roofs, but the roof pitch, uh, uh, did, you, did you take a look at how uh, the pitch compares? Because I think that, that the, the last set of plans, the pit, in fact, I remember commenting on it, the roof had a pretty st steep pitch uh, in the com and I asked about it and you said you needed room for mechanics and mechanicals and such. Um, this one to me actually looks more, the pitch at least seems more historically appropriate, but uh, yeah, it's true that uh, the neighborhood doesn't, you know, it's a, a period kind of a mid to latter half of the 19th century, uh, you know, Greek revival and so on and, and you know, quote unquote Victorian that um, tends to have a steeper pitch. Uh, looking on this view, it looks like the house down at the corner of Otis and Prospect that you can see sticking out there uh, has a steeper pitch, but yet the ones on Prospect don't, but I'm, it's hard to tell just from this. So let me, I'm asking the architect, did you do some analysis of uh, the, the roof designs and pitches in that area to, to see where you fell? Well, we, we've been looking at the roof profiles around the neighborhood. Um, and I think as, as you might find in any, you know, modern, modern neighborhood has been around for a long time there, there's a, there's a whole catalog of different roof styles, pitches, uh, finishes, eave conditions, cornices. And uh, I, I feel that we had, you know, I feel that our, our charge here is to have a building that fits within the larger context and um, you know, just like just like you know, it's very hard to pick an eave height. It's very hard to pick you know mm. a, a window style. You know, I I what I think what we did do is look around enough to know that this isn't this isn't inappropriate. Uh, it's not foreign uh, to any of the buildings in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and what it does do is is help address. Uh, scale issues, which is which is why one would make a choice to do a hip um, for for what the building profile is expected to be. Um, yeah. I would also just say that you know I, we we have done the study to make sure that whatever mechanicals are being utilized are going to fit within the attic space of this building, and that's not that's not a concern of ours at this point. Mm -hmm. We've done Okay, thanks. Uh, and Patricia, I see you put your hand up. Let me make, ask one other question before I turn it over to you. And that's um, about height. Um, as as is noted, the eave excuse me, not yeah, the eave height is about the same as it was before, um, and the reduction in mass was achieved basically through a combination of setback and roof change, rather than um, changing the overall overall height, which would, would have required redesigning, the, you know, giving up parking, right? One layer of parking. I'm just curious as to, you know, that program decision, um, was that just, uh, if you could kind of talk to why you came out with doing it, you know, trying to do it this way rather than, um, uh, eliminate one level of parking, which would have, you know, resulted in a significant height reduction. So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, okay. So the city, the city requires a certain number of parking spaces um, uh -huh. under the ordinance, 
and um, we need to provide that number of parking spaces. The bank needs to provide parking spaces for its employees and those who do work at the bank, um, examiners or whatever, as well as um, guests and customers. So um, we need the parking and to eliminate an entire level of parking uh, would require the bank to find that parking someplace else um, and apply for a special permit under the ITIF. Uh, when we started this prospect, this uh, project a year ago, we actually did not have enough parking and we were applying for a special permit for parking and half of Upper State Street, Harris Street, library people, everybody you can think of, including this neighborhood, um, were up in arms about not having enough parking on site. So the bank needs to provide the parking. The city wants, him to wants them to provide the parking. Uh, the city being all those people who came out to those first original meetings. Um, and the bank doesn't want to have their parking spaces on these streets. Um, and the neighbors, including neighbors in this immediate neighborhood, every meeting have talked about their concern about parking on the streets from hmm. the bank. So the bank is providing parking to uh, satisfy um, its needs, as well as address those that have been expressed by not only these immediate neighbors, but neighbors across the street, including library users. Okay. I suspected it was something like that because uh, Attorney Mead, I, I do recall from those early meetings that uh, the opposition to some of the parking arrangements was quite, quite uh, um, vociferous. Fierce. Yeah, vociferous. That was a word that was on my mind too. All right, Patricia Pecknick, my vice chair, would you like to make a comment? Yes, thank you. And I did discover earlier in the meeting that my fire alarm works. So I hope I was muted for that. <laughs> yeah, apparently you were. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, this commission has always asked for a reduction in height at every meeting since the first. Um, we are not alone in that. The planning board at the last meeting asked the applicant to, you know, lower the entire structure. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a discussion in which the applicant asked whether lowering at five feet would be sufficient. And the planning board said, you know, we can't give you an exact number. This is going to be a function of the proposal in its entirety. So the ridge height in the last proposal was 37 feet and now it's 33 four. So we didn't even get down five feet yet. I think bringing the ridge height down three feet eight isn't really sufficient from in reviewing this, you know, in historical review. And the applicant mentioned that dropping the eave line five, dropping the building five feet would take the eave line down to 20. I'm not saying that's the magic number, but we're still at 246, which is a foot above that tallest house on prospect. So I, I'm gonna offer the same comments about the height as I've offered on in the last proposals because the height is the same. And then it, my comment is that to satisfy the standards and the D ordinance in relation to the setting, the height needs to come down. Um, I, I appreciate you know, some of the things that are done to break up the massing, although I think the recess in the wall on Prospect Street should be deepened, but I'm really just still focusing on the height. Uh, the or DOD ordinance requires adherence to the secretary's standards and the National Park bulletins. And so I'm gonna quote the same bulletins I've previously quoted, uh, one on new additions and densely built environments that says the height should be consistent with the height, not only of the historic building, but of other surrounding buildings. And that even if the facade of the addition can be broken up into elements that are consistent with the scale of the historic building, they have to be consistent with the scale of adjacent buildings. So to restate what was also said in our last advisory review discussion from the brief on new additions, historic buildings, we see that new construction must be subordinate to buildings in visible and close proximity to historic buildings. Uh, designing a new exterior addition to an historic building, the National Park Service says, you know, the new addition should be smaller than the historic building. It should be subordinate in size and design. I'm not getting hung up on the massing right now. I'm really focusing on the, on the height as the thing that uh, makes it not comply with the standards or the DOD ordinance. Um, the brief on new additions and densely built environment states that it's important that the addition will have, will reinforce the scale and character of its setting. 
And again, the Department of the Interior always talks about protecting other surrounding buildings in the district. I don't know what Eve height typical means. The phrase Eve height typical is used uh, in describing the Eve. I'm not sure what the word typical mean. I, I'm frustrated that we're always being asked to look at the view down prospect from state through a screen of, of non-existent trees that are 50 feet tall. I wish that didn't happen. And I, we on the commission were criticized for picking only a couple buildings to do height comparisons. And so I think it, it's fair given that criticism for the applicant to present height comparisons for all the houses on Prospect and, and Otis in, instead of a couple today. I, the fact that the applicant needs parking isn't something that we can discuss at the Historical Commission. I, I did hear things, you know, the planning board suggesting, you know, losing a level of parking and we've, we have had those conversations, but it, you know, that's not, we can't protect the applicant's interest in, in having the parking. It's just still, it's still too, too high. Um, I think beginning the discussion today is important. We didn't get the plans until Friday. I'd be happy to continue the discussion, but I don't think that has given us enough time. So that's all for me for now. Okay. <clears throat> Jimmy, okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, the, it, just, just one second, Attorney Mead, uh, you will have another opportunity to respond, however. Um, any other comments from the board, like Christopher Fay? Um, you haven't, uh, I know you briefly expressed an opinion for previously. Do, any comments at all? I have nothing further to add uh, based on what I've said previously. Yeah, it's too okay. bad. I know the pre uh, previously you, you expressed that you thought it was too, too big, too massive. Okay. Uh, so sounds like you haven't changed your mind. I haven't changed my mind, no. Nope. Okay, now Malcolm, uh, I think you're still out there. Uh, well, maybe not now that I see it. Well, anyway, if you are, pre try pressing star six to see if we can, you can actually be heard. Try that one more time. If not, we'll give up on that. And let me go back to the panelists. Okay, while we're waiting to see if he chimes in, did you want, uh, want to make a comment or respond, uh, Attorney Mead? I, I did, because I think it's really important. Um, the height of this building is consistent with the average height of the buildings in the neighborhood. Um, it, the eave height is a little taller than the uh, eave height of the ones at, uh, you know, basically the three major uh, buildings across or four major buildings across the street on Prospect Street. And similarly, not inconsistent with those buildings on Otis. The height is smaller, shorter than the existing structure, the historic building in every way, the mean, the ridge, uh, and the eave. Um, and it is shorter than the ridge lines of a number of the buildings around um, Prospect Street and Otis. So it's just not true that this building is taller than uh, the entire neighborhood. It's just not true and we've provided those measurements. The next thing is, I, I think that it, and, and maybe, I don't, maybe I misunderstood uh, what, what uh, the vice chair said, but the renderings that we have shown, and this rendering in particular right here is a good example. The only larger tree that we show here um, is a tree to be planted to show what it would look like. The other trees that are on this proposal, particularly the ones um, looking down prospect from state, those exist, we're, we're not taking those away. Those exist, that's a true view from State Street down Prospect Street. The only new tree is this tree right here um, that we show larger um, as it would be to be more full grown. But the other trees exist. And so to take those trees out would actually not be an actual uh, representation of what exists on this uh, in this neighborhood and on this property. So. Uh, you may have an opinion that you you know you 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 believe that your interpretation of the Secretary of Interior standards, which are very subjective, um, don't uh, don't agree. But it's just not true factually that this building is not consistent with the height and or shorter in some respects to the height as it's measured uh, from the rest of the neighborhood. 
and that's important. I, I think it's also important to address the, the comment by uh, Mr. Morgan relative to um, of the neighborhood. And, you know, we've had this struggle uh, for a while um, relative to what neighborhood is this in and what it, is it a part of. Um, and, you know, this is a commercial building. And so we have um, made it of the neighborhood um, in scale and massing um, and a number of other elements, uh, but it's still a part of the historic bank building. And so I, you know, I understand that uh, Mr. Morgan would like it to be clabbered um, similar to some of the other um, residential structures, but it doesn't make it not correct. And again, this is the subjective interpretation of the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Uh, this building, the Secretary of the Interior Standards also notes that if the building is of a distance from the original structure, it should be considered a separate structure. Um, and so it does not detract. I don't, I don't think that it, it's a fair statement or an objective review to say that this building detracts from the 1871 building, which is up on State Street. Um, it complements that building. Um, it certainly doesn't overtake it. It is smaller in height for sure. Um, and certainly the same height or smaller than a number of the components of the surrounding structures. And I just think those facts are important to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it doesn't, the standards don't say it should be read as a separate structure. They say that if there's a connector between the historic structure and the addition is at a distance that it may be able to, to read as a separate structure. And I just, I also want to say, you know, the Eve line was 24-6, the Eve line is 24-6. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not addressing that as a subjective thing. That's just the numbers that you had provided in your presentation. Right, but that's only one of the measurements uh, with all due respect to the vice chair. The, the ridge height and the um, mean height are all um, smaller than the surrounding or shorter than the surrounding neighborhoods. And I guess, I think it's really important to note that you use the term may, which is true. This is the whole point about the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And I'm not saying that your opinion is incorrect, but that's the issue with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And we believe that the that this, act, this now um, is compatible with the neighborhood and certainly doesn't overwhelm any part of either the neighborhood on State Street or on Otis Place and Prospect Street. If I could take back control for a moment. And I see, Joe, I see your hand. Let me just do one thing real quick. Uh, Caitlin, could you go back? I think it was about slide three or four. I think it was in this presentation. Yeah, three. This is where these numbers are. So um, uh, most of the numbers should be here. Um, and this is, of course, this is the one where we have Otis selected structures. We're not sure about that. But anyway, so let's um, uh, um, ridge height. It looks like the, uh, Ms. Mead, what you're, if I, it sounds like you, the point you're trying to make is that compared to many of the houses on Prospect Street, uh, those, I'm thinking of those large two family ones directly across. The ridge height is um, slightly lower, three, four, five, yeah, about three or four, almost four feet lower. Uh, the eave height is about a foot higher, and you know, so this is a reflection of the, the decreased slope of the roof that the, the ridge could be lower yet the eave higher. Um, it, it, the so is, is this where you were making your point that it's not higher than the neighborhood buildings? That's correct. And the mean also, which is how we measure, of course. Yeah, which is not on here for some right, reason. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what the mean is. So the mean of the proposed is 2811. The mean of the 1870 building is 32, two and a half. And the mean of 11 to 13 prospect is 30 feet, six inches. And the mean of the selected structures, which I'm hoping Christopher identifies is 20 feet, excuse me, 27 feet, one half inch. Yeah, that, that, that is the one on the corner of Otis and Prospect. So I think, believe that's 16 Prospect, right? On Otis and Prospect. Okay, so across, the, across Otis Place. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I was going to say the the only comment I have on, on this, and then I'll I'll get to you, uh, Mr. Morgan, is that the mean is a little misleading when um, in, in two ways, especially with respect to the historic building, that has essentially a flat roof. So that calculation, I, I assume the mean is kind of like the average height. All right, uh, I believe that's what that means. So when you've got a flat roof like that, that kind of, you know, it's it's gonna be, have a different visual effect than a pitched roof where the average will be, you know, somewhere roughly midway up the roof, you know, give or take, whatever, depending on how the math works out. Right. Um, so it's a little, it's a little, you know, it's a little bit apples but, and oranges, but, it, but I think you're Isn't point. that the point is the, the right. original building was a hip roof uh, with a low mean to decrease the 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 mass of that of of the part of the existing building, I, I I think I mean like any like any design, we're trying to use the tools that are available to designers to achieve a goal, and the goal is to reduce the visible mass of a building. Mm -hmm. And so, choosing pitch roof pitches and roof styles to accomplish that goal is exactly what we heard asked of us coming out of the last round of meetings. Yeah, my comments um, weren't intended to uh, d disparage or discredit that that design choice. <laughs> I was just saying that it's a, it's a little bit tough because the, the, the historic building has a has an unusual roof, both, you know, f f especially for that neighborhood where you've got all these, you know, pitched roofs around. Um, that's all, I, that was my only point. Yeah, and um, I, I, just yeah. I just I just want to point out, that's why we put all three measurements in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody's trying to hide anything here. That's why we did the ridge, the eave, and the mean. I, I, I just wanted to be clear about what all of those were. Okay. Oh, except the mean is missing on the slide. Right. Um, it, but it's uh, in my submission, which you all have in front okay. of you. Okay. Uh, and it's in the line drawings that you've also all yeah. received. Yeah. Okay. I, it's my personality. I can't help commenting on these on little things like that. Um, Mr. Morgan, you've been wanting to say something. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah, in fact, I, I, my comments were really relative to these numbers. Um, I took, I, you know, I shot these numbers with a laser. It was last summer because, you know, I had to do it at, in the evening because of the the um, intensity of the sun uh, on the faces of the prospect buildings. Um, but I shot the um, I shot the roof, the low roof, which actually is eighty percent of the roof of the historical building, the eighteen seventy building, and that's at twenty four feet. So. Um, the, if you were to weight that, uh, for an average, you probably find that actually it's well below 30 feet, the, the mean of the, uh, of the, the, uh, the average height of the building. Now, I'm not talking about the mode. I'm not talking about the middle between the, the opti the, the maximum and the minimum. I'm talking about the mean weighted per roof area. Okay. Now the 11 to 13 prospect street buildings and ones before them, like seven, nine, uh, or in the range of what I shot, I believe was, I um, don't have the numbers here in front of me right now, but I remember something like in the range of 21 to 23 feet. The one at the corner of Otis and Prospect, I believe was around 21 or 21.6. So um, I, would, I would ask the architect to uh, check these numbers again, because I, I, I I, they don't line up with, with, what, um, what I, with what I shot last summer, so. Well, we could get you and uh, Meridian uh, together to uh, reconcile your numbers because they went out and did the same activity. Absolutely, for us. I'd be happy and, to. And they I'd be they have produced a document that has given us all of these existing building numbers. So uh, exactly, the fact that they I, have a I would like to. Is, I would like to review their numbers. I would like to review their entire calculations, please, if they could provide those. I would do that. Thank you. Okay. Any any other comment from the board? I don't see any other hands up. And I guess there isn't anyone else left to comment since Peter is recused. Um, okay, well, I don't really might have much, anything else to say myself. I think that I'll, I will offer and um, my own reactions. Um, similar to, as a certain, of, several members of the public said uh, it's an improvement. I think that the renderings do, um, do sh 
show the impact of the combination of the roof change and the setback to present a less of a um, overwhelming feel to it. Um, but before tonight's meeting, when I was looking at this and thinking about the uh, return to the uh, brick, excuse me, brick um, cladding versus um, clabberds, um, I could sort of go, you know, I, I see the argument both ways. And especially with, I think that the, the brick, you know, it's certainly recognizable. How should I say this? It, where it is a commercial structure, you know, it, it I, I can sort of see the argument for for that, um, even though there, I don't think there are any brick residences in that area, but we're not talking about a residence, right? And it's, we're never gonna be able to escape this, the problem of the fact that we're um, building a commercial or proposed to build a commercial building in a, that juts into and surrounded on three sides by residential uh, structures. That's, that's, that's just a fact of life that, that you guys are dealing with and we're all dealing with, um, us on the commission, the abutters and the institution for savings. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the a couple of things to follow up on, uh, what can, um, I'm trying to think what the easiest way can, why don't we do this as far as the Meridian things, can, uh, are there a contact information uh, on the plan somewhere? I didn't, I can't flip to it right now, but maybe, uh, the, you know, just, Maybe we can get uh, Joe in, in touch with them so they can, you know, compare the measurements and how they were each taken to see if uh, one or the other um, may be an error or it, or not. Um, Mr. Chair, I, yeah. you know, I, we would like to have this, um, the commission's review um, move forward tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure um, how we're going to do that. Um, you know, uh, we can certainly have Meridian um, verify that as at a follow-up uh, um, submission to the commission. Um, it would be highly unusual with all due respect to Mr. Morgan to have a commission member call and have a private conversation with um, the consultant to the applicant um, outside of a public hearing. So, um, you know, I'm not really sure what, you, you know, we have the plans in front of you, the plans are stamped um you have the renderings we have the line drawings we have um uh, you know happy to do it but um can i ask a question of caitlin caitlin are you hi i'm here hi i'm sorry um were the plants when were the plants submitted and were they submitted on time and what's you know what's the deal with that because i didn't see them and posted till friday um, yeah, I believe we received the plans um, Thursday late afternoon, and then they were posted Friday morning. Um, we have a one week deadline for revised plans uh, to be submitted to the historical commission. Okay. Well, what, two things, let's tackle, tackle the easier one first. When you, I think, when Lisa Mead, when you said you'd like to proceed tonight, could you explain exactly what you had in mind? Well, I, I would like our presentation to be done and for the commission to undertake drafting a decision to, or a recommendation to the planning board. I see, okay. Um, and you're right, I don't, I don't know of a precedent for um, what um, was discussed with uh, Mr. Morgan and, and the, um, now Meridian is Meridian that they're not the architects, right? Are they um, engineers. civil engineers or what? There are, there are surveys and surveyors and civil engineers. Right. I think it's fine for Mr. Morgan to rely on his own calculations then. All right, well, what we can do is um, as far as that, um, I think we can, you know, if, if there, as, as you point out, Attorney Mead, uh, you know, the, the, the engineering firm has um, supplied their, their drawings, they've got their, 
their their stamp, if you will, on them. So they're the assumption is that uh, they are correct to the best of their knowledge. We can um, we can after this you know outside this meeting you know uh, Joe can uh, you know review what he has measured and try to compare them to what we've got there and see what we um, see if we can resolve what you know any apparent differences uh, see what the deal is with that. But um, and as far as drafting report. Um, I, what I can try to do is um, hmm, is uh, create a draft that we can uh, review as a board at our meeting of the se our second meeting of this month, which is I believe the twenty. Hang on, wait for it the twenty eighth uh, to see if the board is comfortable with whatever it is I end up. <laughs> writing, which at the moment I, I'm really not sure, but because I'm going to have to put all this together and, and figure out where, uh, how, where it all falls out. Um, I want to review um, this, the standards again. I know uh, Ms. Pechnik has um, quoted some of those, so I want to, again, uh, you know, consider it. How, how they apply it to, in this case. You made a point, uh, Attorney Mead, about the interpretation of the standards being subjective and to a certain, to actually to a large extent, I'll have to agree that it's true that the, you know, their interpretation is subjective, it's, but it's, um, it can be made less so by reliance on um, experience, reliance on uh, case history, so to speak, in the sense of, other things that have been done, good and bad examples. The uh, Secretary of the Interior generally has supply, you know, does supply examples of, you know, what uh, things that do or don't comply and so forth that can be used to help remove some of the ambiguity to exactly how those standards are to be applied. And, and then, and then this board will do its best to um, to apply them in a in a way that we think is appropriate and fair to. Uh, both the applicant and the, the city and the standards and the abutters and everybody else involved. All right, so- May I, may I, may I add something before you step away? <laughs> okay, you just got in there, just in the nick of time before I was about to move on. Yeah, ahead, no, but yeah, so, you know, as long as we are reasonable, fair, rational and consistent in our interpretation and application of the standards, mm -hmm. that's, that's actually what this board's job is, so. Yeah. I agree. Can I, can I just have a clarification on the process, Mr. Chair, because it sounds yeah. like it's a, a little bit different than um, how you've done it in the past. Not that I, I'm not arguing with that. I just want to understand. So is it your intention that you would prepare a recommendation and then present it to the commission at the next meeting for their approval before it gets put onto the planning board? Um, because we we were looking at next week and that and that doesn't sound like it's going to happen. And so if you're then looking at your meeting on the 28th, that means that we're into February or so into the um, the planning board. Mm. Well, it's been done two ways in the past. Um, in the first couple of instances for this particular application, uh, I was basically prepared the report and sent it on to the planning board. Uh, the, the, I think it was the third iteration of that, um, that was uh, strenuously objected to by the applicant. That would be you, Ms. Mead, uh, as not somehow not um, reflecting the opinion of the entire board. And you wanted it be brought back to the board for their review and, and uh, uh, to, to verify that they did all it did accurately reflect the views of the board. So that's why I was proposing to do it that way. Um. That's all, and I think, especially in this case, I think that's that's probably a good idea because, um, you know, that's it's a complex project. Uh, I know I want to think about it some more uh, in terms of putting together everything I've heard tonight between the comments of the board and the abutters and the applicant and you know architect and yourself. And um, I and I think, given the importance and magnitude of this particular project, uh, that it's only fair to the applicant to ensure that um, the report accurately reflects the sense of the commission. Well, I don't obviously I don't disagree with that because that was my complaint before. I didn't believe that, as you well know, that the um, that the recommendation 
conversation reflected the conversation that took place at the commission. So um, <laughs> I guess um, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to live with that. We won't be into the planning board until February. Okay. Okay. Um, well, don't go anywhere, Ms. Mead. I think you may be involved in the next discussion. Um, the that ends the uh, discussion of the project for of uh, the institution for savings at 93 State Street. We're going to move on to the project, also represented by uh, Mead, Tolerman, and Costa, at 3 Hancock Street. Uh, this was uh, a case where it was a raising of the roof. You might recall this. Uh, we met back. Um, well, this was continued from 10 December, where there was some rather lengthy discussion uh, because it got um, involved with um, how the scope of the, the uh, well, among other things, the scope of the commission's, for lack of a better term, jurisdiction or, or legal authorization and among other things. So let me just say first a couple of words about that because um, there was a correspondence from uh, Attorney Mead uh, to the board, um, to myself and the board, um, uh, that re made reference to the um, scope of the committee of the commission's um, what it can lawfully do or not do, and uh, the procedure. So I just want to. Uh, so I know uh, Vice Chair Pecknick and myself have a couple uh, words on that. And for those, I assume the members of the board have reviewed that memo. This is the memo of uh, 8th of January from uh, uh, Attorney Mead. And um, in it, uh, Ms. Mead um, uh, makes a, mentions the pro protracted discussion, uh, when, which may have gone into matters beyond our um, lawful jurisdiction. And uh, so the first thing I'll point out is that there was no actual motion or action taken that exceeded our lawful jurisdiction. And uh, I think the reason for that is that I think I understood as chair that that point is, is well taken and that there are limits to our uh, what we lawfully can and cannot do. Uh, I do however disagree with um, Attorney Mead's opinion that the, about what constitutes, um, uh, what are the requirements are in a vote of, uh, because the way I read the ordinance and we have, checked with uh, the planning board and others that the that that and they generally agree with my reading which is that um, the the ordinance very explicitly states and you quote this in your memo attorney me that four members um, constitute a quorum and any approval shall require a positive vote of a quorum the term a quorum having just been defined as four members. So that's why I held that at least that a vote, uh, if there were only four members present, they would have to be unanimous for, uh, for it to be an affirmative vote. And I still uh, hold to that. And I should point out to, the, to all the commissioners that you know um, any uh, memo uh, opining ab about the board's scope or jurisdiction or procedure is uh, just that, it's an opinion. It's kind of uh, analogous, if you will, if this was a legal proceeding, it'd be like a lawyer's argument to which the other side has, makes its arguments and then a judge would make a determination, which in that case is called, end quote, opinion. But anyway, it's, um, and everyone's entitled to their opinion. Um, and as far as the, um, there was some, dis you know, we did have discussions with the planning board folks as far as um, what's the scope of the building inspector or building commissioner and this board. And I think, uh, Patricia, did you have a few comments that you wanted to make about that particular issue? Yeah, just, I'm just addressing my comments to other people on the commission who read the memo and just reminding you that we all have the, the handbook that was prepared by the author of the ordinance and the planning board. And because the, the point was made by the applicant in this memo that the NHC's function is, is advisory under demo delay based on the fact that the word advise is, is in the preamble to that ordinance. So I just wanna remind all of us, um, so article 10 of building demolition says that the intent of the ordinance is to preserve and protect significant buildings. And, and indeed 
the applicant is correct that it says the NHC is empowered to advise the Newburyport Building Commissioner with respect to the issuance of permits for demolition. The ordinance then lays out a number of procedures which are not merely advisory in that there's no process described under which the building commissioner can act in contradiction to the NHC's findings. So section 5 308, 308 review procedures, the NHC is the sole authority in the determination of whether a building is historically significant and preferably preserved the language says the commission shall determine, shall notify the building commissioner. So the building commissioner may only issue a building permit for the demolition of an historic structure uh, after the NHC's determination and notification process. And the building commissioner is, commissioner is acting on our determination as a fact, not, not contemplating it simply as advice that may be considered. As in the demolition plan review, the ordinance says if the application for demolition is based on a claim of structural deficiency, then the applicant may be required by the commission to submit a structural engineering report. So the fact that the commission is empowered under those circumstances to require that a report be submitted for its own review means that the structural condition of the building is of concern to the commission. Um, so we have the preamble that talks about advise, but under procedures, we have determine, notify, required by the commission. And we see uh, under demo delay that if we determine a structure is preferably preserved, then the building commissioner shall not issue a permit unless the NHC informs the inspector that the NHC has been satisfied upon specified conditions approved by this commissions and that you know such conditions may include may include the review and approval of the site plans then we see that if the demo delay has been imposed by the NHC the delay begins when we file our report and the applicant may you know apply to receive a permit within the 12 months by submitting an, an amended plan and that the applicant is free to go through that process as many times as they wish within the 12 months. Of course, we wanna work with the applicant so that they don't have to wait the 12 months. That's one of our objectives. Um, so as stated in our handbook, um, this review is required before the building inspector may, a, a commissioner may act in issuing this permit. And the specified conditions may relate to, and this is in boldface and underline in our handbook, the specified conditions that we impose may relate to any aspect of the structure. That's what it says. And then in section 5310, enforcements and remedies, the NHC is described as the body that can give written approval to the building commissioner to issue a permit in the case in which an historically significant building or structure has been intentionally demolished without a permit. So that's what we went through on 12 Harrison, just reminding you. So the NHC is not described as recommending, but as really approving or, or not approving. The only time in this ordinance that we see the, the building commissioner acting unilaterally, independently in making determinations is in a case of emergency demolition. So it's a serious threat to public health and safety. So uh, yes, the applicant's right that, you know, building and construction are the domain of the building commissioner, but it's the scope of demolition as it will impact the historic structure that we've been talking about. That's why we talk about structural in integrity. We're always talking about the extent to which certain kinds of demolition might you know, in addition to destroying vintage framing materials might jeopardize the rest of the structure. It's, it's the demolition plan that is triggering our inquiry about structural conditions. Um, under demo delay, it says we review alterations to a structure or part thereof, including character defining exterior architectural features and character defining architectural features are, are defined in the commission handbook to include, quote, architectural style and general arrangement and setting, along with kind and texture of exterior building materials, type and style of windows, doors, lights, chimneys, dormers, and other fixtures. So the applicant is correct that uh, because the NHC is not the permit grantor, 
the NHC itself is not, doesn't have the authority condition the building permit. Um, but the permit grantor issues the building permit for demolition only as a result of our actions. And we absolutely have the authority con to condition our approval of demolition on certain conditions that we impose, ideally because the plan satisfies the standards. And as long as our conditions are aimed at protecting and preserving the historic research. So that's the intent of the ordinance. That's the ordinance as we've practiced it. And it's coherent with what is in the commission handbook that was you know, written uh, in consultation with the drafter of the ordinance and the, and the planning office and also consistent with the laws of the, of the Commonwealth. So just, just reminding you what's in our handbook. I know sometimes you know, we don't see each other and sometimes when you uh, get information, it can be sort of contradictory to what you might remember from the handbook, but always just go back and, and reference the handbook. So, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, th thank you, Patricia. So, um, in, uh, I'll certainly allow you know give you an opportunity to to make your presentation. But I hope that I I, I did I, I may be able to um, uh, you know help things along a little bit with uh, with the following. Oh, and by the way, that, that we are at the at the end of the meeting. There's a section where we're going to talk about procedural things and we we are making a slight change to the way we do the voting on uh, historical significance and preferentially or preferably preserved that will I think clarify a little bit it doesn't really apply in this particular case but just that's just an FYI coming a little bit later tonight anyway um, as you correctly note uh, well as attorney me will you be presenting or one of your other uh, partners um, so I thought, um, so first of all, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, attention to all of this. Uh, and I'm not going to, um, I'm not, our goal tonight is to um, attempt to clarify and get the, um, the commission to take a, a vote on what we're being proposed. And so we'd like to kind of roll back to what our proposal is, mm -hmm. um, and get out of the weeds. Okay. Um, and so what I'd like to do is um, turn this over to Scott Brown to remind everybody why we're here. Um, and um, I think that he has provided, uh, you know, a number of plans in the past and he has confirmed with Jennifer as the board requested relative to the demolition um, numbers. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott um, and I appreciate both uh, the chair and the vice chair's um, various opinions as well. All right, thank you. But for, uh, for, um, uh, Mr., uh, for the <coughs> architect uh, goes on and, and he will be allowed to speak, no, no problem there. But what I wanted to say is that, um, and first of all, you should, we should, you know, quick, we can go through this quickly because uh, it's been a while. So we wanna re refresh our memories as to what the proposal is. Uh, I, I, I looked at my notes from the, when we were last together and, it, and um, I believe uh, Scott said, is it Scott or Mr. Scott? Um, Scott, Scott Brown. Brown, right, okay. Said that if, if people are okay with the design, you know, why don't we, you know, go ahead and remove the delay, but we got involved in it discussion of structural issues. So uh, since then, a couple things have happened. For one, we have the uh, affidavit that you're probably all familiar with. That's the, um, uh, what's it called? Um, I had a note here, the code, code and permit compliance affidavit. Right. And uh, so I actually uh, have a, a, a draft motion all prepared that I think will, uh, to that is, that would make sense, but if and only if we basically don't have any other uh, concerns about the overall design. So, I want to know, so um, with that kind of in our back pocket, so to speak, uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead and just refresh our memory as to what the uh, overall design is, and um, we and then we can hopefully resolve the issues as to what we, you know what, what we need to worry about or not worry about structurally, and then we can perhaps make a motion, have a have a vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll keep this uh, very brief because we've seen this application a couple of times. Uh, but again, uh, Scott Brown, uh, the architect for the project. So again, you know, we're, we're coming back to you. We are seeking a release from the demolition delay. 
Uh, this application is for a roof line change. We are only changing the roof on the back of the building. And Caitlin, if you could just go to our uh, proposed elevations, sheet 822.1. Excellent, thank you. So we're only changing the roof line on the back of the building. Uh, for the most part, the windows remain the same size and in the same locations. And in this sheet, I've indicated in red uh, where those changes uh, actually are going to be. So we believe we've met all of the requests of this commission regarding the design of this project. I do not remember any concerns about the design at our last meeting on December 10th. And uh, I also hope at, at this point, at least some of us can agree that uh, some of the items that were discussed on the 10th are, are not the purview of the commission. Uh, Caitlin, if you could just go to uh, the last sheet in the set here, X2. Okay, thank you. So I really wanted to point out the only change that we've made to the materials. And the only change that we've made is actually on this sheet in the upper right hand corner, uh, that is the rear elevation. Uh, this pause between hearings has um, made us think about our approach here and what we, we might need to do. So on this rear elevation, we are now showing uh, uh, an increased area of wall removal because we think that that is something that we might need to do. So despite this increase, you'll see in the lower right hand corner of this sheet, uh, we are still comfortably under the 25% uh, DCOD special uh, permit threshold. And uh, Caitlin, if we could just go back to the proposed elevations again, A2.1. Thank you. So, you know, I, I, I strongly believe that, you know, we have the beginnings of, of what is going to be a good project. Uh, and again, uh, you know, what you're seeing here is um, a design that has, is in response to the comments of, of this commission. And uh, with that, uh, we would like to respectfully request that the commission release this project from the demolition delay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And that on that uh, X2 sheet that, uh, so those calculations included both that rear wall and those uh, relatively small areas affected by the window changes, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, I think to your comment that you don't remember any design issues, I think the only one I know, I think it was Mr. Morgan had some comments about windows, but um, a little, I don't want to just rely on my memory on that. I think uh, I, from my, I did review my notes. I know um, Peter McNamee seemed to feel that uh, overall the design while having some drawbacks, he, I think he and I are in agreement that we don't, aren't particularly crazy about the new roof line, but overall, uh, as you just put it, Mr. Brown, it's probably, uh, you know, overall, and, uh, you know, up an improvement. Uh, but why don't I uh, see if any of my board members uh, have reason to disagree with your um, assessment that um, it is a good project and there aren't any um, problems with the overall design. So board, that ball is in your court, but does anyone have any pro or con? Want to uh, opine in favor or again the um, proposal? Patricia, is that a real fire going behind you? It is, but I have to keep an eye <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that the footprint of the house won't change, uh, that there's not a, you know, the expansion of the rear yard. Mm -hmm. And I think we should support plans that preserve the footprint of smaller houses. I, I think Christopher Fay had mentioned, and maybe Peter, that they appreciate how the facade will look when renovated. I also like that this time the applicant included calculations about the percentage of the wall area to be demoed. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's unfortunate that the original proposal to at least preserve the form of the roof line has been set aside. I know that was one, I can't remember if it was plan A, B or C earlier, 
um, that that roof line was the defining feature of that house. And I understand that roof was raised on this, you know, pre 1800 house and that roofs do get raised. And I, you know, I think it makes more sense with the secretary standards to preserve the roof line. I, I don't want it raised at the ridge line, but um, if no other commissioners have take issue with that and if nobody else has things to say about the windows, um, you know, I yield to them. I think cutting five new windows isn't the best preservation outcome for the house, but um, but I would be willing to support, uh, you know, a certain kind of motion to to approve that with mm -hmm. some, you know, some caveats. I, I will also point out that I think we would be further along if the initial application had correctly shown where the chimney is. And just to say in general, about applications that when there are errors in the in the proposed plans, we always end up with continuances. It happened on 123 and it happened here. So, you know, there, it's taken a while, but it's not only because we, you know, have been talking about the exact same plan the whole time. So. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, Christopher, I see your hand also raised. Yeah, I just, um, last time I had, uh, expressed some concern about how far we were digging into this and I continue to have some reservations about how you know where's our where's our jurisdiction lie the, but the other thing I just wanted to bring up briefly was there, there was some conversation last time about uh, how this may relate to the other house on what Harrison right um, and I, to me that's a slippery slope because I understand the concerns and the commission I have the same concerns but I don't think we can apply you know, there's there's some bad actors. Uh, we've we've encountered at least two of them in my time on the commission um, that were willing to to step before us. And you know, I'll I'll as a high school teacher, it's, it's some maybe it's just a little bit easier sometimes to maybe recognize the bad actors a little bit quicker than anybody else. I don't I don't sense that here. Um, we've seen Scott's work uh, many times, and I don't always agree with with his work and his designs um and, and i express that when i do but um i don't get the sense that the, the house is going to be torn down as a result of this so i just wanted to, to bring that up because we can apply that to anything we could apply we could have just applied it to the bank and so we, how can we yeah. trust the bank how can we trust the next applicant uh, mm -hmm. to not lie to us and then tear down the house or tear down the bank or destroy the neighborhood type of thing so i'm okay with this i was last time and that's all i have to say and thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, and that's kind of what I was alluding to. Um, we, we meaning we, uh, the myself, the vice chair, Andy Port, Caitlin, we, we, uh, Jennifer Blanchet. We, we did have some discussions about uh, exactly what you're talking about there, Chris. As far as what is or is not our legal purview. Uh, again, it was again, it was the some of the issues that Attorney Mead raised in her memo, and you know, correctly so. So. Um, uh, in light of that discussion and, and most of the kind of clarifications we made, uh, I have drafted a motion which I'll I'll read, and a few, and we can take a, a vote as to whether you all um, would care to approve this. I think it. Um, if there are no major design issues, I think this should do it. So I'll go ahead and read it. Proposed motion. The one year demolition delay on three Hancock Street shall be lifted with the conditions that the code and permit compliance affidavit is signed, comma, and that only the section of roof to be raised and its framing may be removed, semicolon. If additional demolition is found to be necessary, the applicant must return to the planning department for approval, period. So that's my proposed motion. Is there a second? Like me to I'll second that. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Faye seconds that. Okay, so I think uh, Gretchen or no take, I'm gonna assume that Mr. Conrath, I think he's still around there, but was never able to make himself heard. So I think we're gonna have to assume for the purposes of records and everything that he's not here. So uh, your vote, uh, Chris? Mr. Mr. Richards, actually just yeah. quite, I apologize for interrupting because I, I just need to understand the motion. Um, so, so Mr. Brown has shown on this plan that um, in the event that back wall needs to come down, that would still be under the 25%, right? So does your motion mean that uh, if that 
back wall needs to come down, he has to go to the planning department for approval of that? Or I, I just want to understand what you're, what you're saying here. Okay, yeah, I didn't think, that. see, I drafted that before, <laughs> before I saw that back wall thing. Um, Caitlin, go back to that X2 with that for a second. So, um, all right, so we'll hold off the vote for that for just a second. Uh, or here are the, the voting. The, what can you, Mr. Brown, what's, now what is the rationale? Let me see if it, what, what's the uh, uh, concern that gave rise to the possibility that you might have to demo that rear wall? Well, one of the things that we did after the last hearing is we had a discussion myself and, um, you know, James Bork, who mm -hmm. uh, might, might be out there. James is the, um, the, the builder, yeah. uh, yep. the builder and, and the owner of this property. And, and we really took a hard look at that back wall and, and um, you know, there's a lot of existing glass there and it's, it's a, you know, a bunch of different windows that are slapped together and, and really our, our proposal cause calls for a, a reduction in the amount of fenestration back there. Right. So we also need to, to lift that wall plate as well to sit those new rafters on because that wall is getting, getting higher. And um, James really thought about the difficulty of, of doing that. And, um, you know, he really wanted us to show that entire wall being removed because he thinks that's what's going to have to happen. So, um, you know, and just in, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, we just decided to show it all being removed for this application. Okay, I'm making a light, slight modification. I'm gonna withdraw that motion. I'm making a slight edit to it now that I think will uh, remove this particular problem. Give me one second, demolition plan. And that's, uh, this is page X2. Uh, okay, uh, let me uh, then, uh, first of all, thank you for, I'm actually almost <laughs> glad you interrupted. So I've, I've modified that, that motion. I'm gonna reread it and we'll, and um, uh, as far as procedurally, Gretchen helped me out here. I think, can we, can I just simply withdraw that even though it's been seconded and propose a new motion? Does anyone know? Yep. Okay. All right. So okay. here is, thank you, Gresham, very much. Okay. Here is the new motion. Almost the same, slightly changed. The one year demolition delay on 3 Hancock Street shall be lifted with the conditions that the code and permit compliance affidavit is signed and that only the section of roof to be raised and its framing and the areas indicated in the de demolition plan, paren, page X2, close paren, may be removed. If additional demolition is found to be necessary, the applicant must return to the planning department for approval. So in other words, what you've indicated there on X2, uh, if you don't go beyond that, then you would not need to return. Does that modified motion have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Seconded by Mr. Fay. While your mic is still on, Chris, do you have a vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, Peter McNamee, your vote? Yes. Thank you. Joe Morgan, your vote? A no. No? Okay. I, that, that was right. It was a no, right? Uh, that's correct. No. Okay. Ms. Pecknick? I'm abstaining. You're abstaining. Mm hmm. Hmm. And me, I'll I'll gonna vote a yes. Uh, so we have hmm three yes, a nay, and an abstention. Is Malcolm uh, is Malcolm on? Well, I thought he was, but he still hasn't been able to make himself heard. Uh, Malcolm, if he you can hear on, me, and I've prompted him a couple times to unmute himself. Yeah, which is star six, I believe, right? Yep. So Malcolm, if you're listening, try hitting star six on your phone to see if you can unmute yourself. Because uh, Attorney Mead is very anxious we get a fourth vote on this. At least I think that's why she brought your name up. Yes, sir. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, still. Um, Malcolm, do you want to try star nine? Try that. Not no, not getting yeah. anything. Yeah. Is it possible that Malcolm's uh, cell phone is the culprit here and can he call in from a landline? He has, does, does he have the call-in information? Uh, yes, I gave him the, the dial-in information. That's that's how he is on, on the phone now. I don't know which type of phone he's using. Well, actually I should be able to tell 948. Let's see, uh, give me a second here. And for you, that is his mobile line. Um, I'm not even sure. He, he, I, that's the one I always use for him. I'm not sure if you have that, but it, you know, if he's not, I'm not even sure he can hear us at this point or if he's there because he's not, doesn't seem to be taking the required action. Well, what we can, yeah. Glenn, Glenn. I, yes. Are we are we saying that legally we have a quorum of five? Well, we people? have a quorum in the meeting, but right. legally we have a quorum of five or possibly six people. But it always requires four positive votes to do anything. Yes, because right, that's the way I read the ordinance. A, a, a four is normally a simple majority of the board. Um, so if the board, if everyone, if we had seven people and they were all here, we would only we would have we would need four positive or affirmative votes and you could have up to three negative votes but it would still pass uh when people are absent you the way again the way i read the audience is you still need an affirmative vote of a quorum which is four people yeah um, Glenn. So I'm, I'm just, I'm I, just I, if i could if i'm just reading this um four members this is a quote directly from attorney mead's memo but it's, i assume it's a quote directly from the the law Yes. Four members of the commission, which is a simple majority of its members, shall constitute a quorum. We have that. Any approval shall require a positive vote of a quorum. Right. It doesn't say a right. unanimous vote of a quorum. Right. It's, right. it's a positive vote of the quorum, and I, I guess that's my point. So, it, and your um, interpretation is at well, uh, three because two would not be a positive. That's but correct. It would be a split so that it would be three, and I know that that's your legal opinion. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm a constitutional scholar recently, <laughs> but um, <laughs> as we are all we are. Wrong? Well, well, Chris, well, the... I, don't, I don't know. I, to me, I mean, it's not my legal opinion, but um, I don't know. We did, we did check this with the planning office today. So you always have to have four positive votes, no matter what. At least, yeah. So I can, um, sure. and, you know, Caitlin's here, so maybe she can have a comment about that. I, I, I have to tell you, I disagree. There are, yeah, I know. there are area, I know, I, I know you know that, but there are, um, there are times when, um, for example, the planning board, um, it requires a, a, a vote of the, of, of those, of the membership of the body, not of those present, right? So in, in the planning board, for example, when you're approving a special permit, it's as the board is constituted, not of those present. Um, this commission historically, and because of this ordinance, it has been a, a majority of those present, uh -huh. assuming there is a quorum present, obviously. But this commission has always acted on a majority of those present, not um, quorum. Yeah, that's not what I was told today. That historically, it's always required for affirmative Chair, votes. Chair Richard, I, mean, if, uh, if, I can just, if I, I, if just, I may. Uh, Gidley, go I ahead. Think, is that Peter? Yeah, I, I, I actually, um, if, if the idea behind, um, if the idea is that we want to have uh, four out of the seven, ideally vote, then what, what is the point behind a quorum if we're going to hold the exact same standard? Um, the idea behind a quorum is to be able to have a deciding body. There is no mention of unanimous anywhere there. So I'm, I'm in agreement that, that a positive vote means that the, uh, a simple majority essentially of the quorum. Okay. The, uh, a, a more productive avenue might be for me to ask Mr. Morgan if there's anything that could be done that would change his mind. Um, 
Well, I, I could make another motion and phrase it the way I'd like to see it proceed. Is that is that yeah. Uh, fair? Yeah, sure. There's so the motion. So I would make a, I would make a um, an alternative motion requesting from the applicant a uh, an engineering review of the proposed raising of the roof. Uh, rel at, and relative to other interior modifications that they will be making. And this will be by a, an engineer uh, on the, um, and this would, this would be uh, an engineer that would be acceptable to the city of Newburyport and to the um, uh, Newburyport Historical Commission. I see this as uh, actually um, a, you know, a new precedent that I would like to apply for any projects going forward um, where a roof structure uh, on a historical uh, building is going to be altered so that we can have uh, visibility on the, uh, and, a, and a reasonable risk assess uh, assessment about the possibility of um, demolition beyond what is actually proposed by an architect or builder without having that structural input and without knowing the condition of um, interior conditions, structural conditions. Okay, so my motion is to request that from the applicant this evening so they can start preparation of that and so that they can get back to us in two weeks or four, four weeks, get back to us with a, prof a professional opinion from a structural engineer to make sure that the proposed roof changes and other changes are going to be compatible with the existing structure. Mr. Chair, the applicant doesn't agree with that. With all due respect to Mr. Morgan, there's no, first of all, it's not something the commission has ever asked for before. There's no jurisdiction for that within the within the decision itself. Uh, I mean, excuse me, within the body of law governing the commission itself for such a, um, for such a report. Um, so the, Mr. Morgan can make that, the applicant doesn't agree with that motion and will not be providing that report. Okay, well, the applicant doesn't move forward then, I guess, because I'm, I am not persuaded that uh, three positive votes passed the motion. I was going to, you know, I think, well, the, it's true that we don't have any jurisdiction over things like interior and so forth, which uh, Mr. Morgan uh, uh, suggested. I, I think that it could, uh, I would have to look again to be sure, but I know there's mention of requiring uh, reports to Usually, it's in the context of when there's a uh, demolition requested in the context of a full demolition due to uh, conditions. Uh, you know, they're saying that the house is too far gone to be salvaged. That's the, I believe, that's the context of the authority of the board to request uh, an engineering report. Um, right. We're not. We're not requesting. Yeah. We're not. I, did not apply for that. Yes, I, I, I'm understand. sorry. I did it. Was I? Was it correct that it was explained to us that the rear wall would have to come down for structural reasons? I thought I heard that a, a little bit ago. Not, Is that wrong? We're not requesting to demo the entire structure for structural mm -hmm. reasons. Right. That's not what we're requesting. And it, really, quite frankly, at this point, the applicant would be better off actually going and doing a significant demo over 25% and getting a special permit and changing the footprint of the house. If, the, if this is the kind of, of conditions that are gonna be imposed on a project like this with that, which has a reputable builder and a reputable architect who's been very transparent and forthcoming, it, at this point, with the cost and the work that's being requested um, it would really make more sense for the applicant to do a demo uh, demolition control overlay district special permit. Mm -hmm. Well, the only last thing I can suggest is um, there was uh, some, there was a, one of the attendees I see is um, as listed as Rebecca Bork, that might be the, the builder. If the only thing I can suggest is if he would like to, comment on uh, why he feels the engineering report is not necessary that might sway the opinion of Mr. Morgan, you, you're welcome to, you're welcome to, you know, provide that. Uh, the other alternative is, is whether we would, if, 
is Miss whether Vice Chair Pendick would uh, can reconsider her um, vote as well. That's another uh, that, that would also if that if that vote changed, it would also permit the project to go forward. But that's that I don't want. I'm not pressuring anyone or trying to twist any arms. It's totally up to you guys and your you know. <laughs> As they say in Congress, vote your conscience, so to speak. No, seriously, you know, vote the way you feel is uh, justifiable and defensible and consistent with how you think it should be. Um, so, so having said that, um, Patricia, do you, do you have any inclination to reconsider your vote? No, sir. Okay. The, um, and, uh, Uh, Ms. You know, is Ms. Me? Do you know if that uh, attendee that's listed as Rebecca Bork is that the builder? And do you think they would want to offer any? Um, he has nothing more to add other than what Scott has already provided. Okay, well, Mr. Chair, may, may I say something? Uh, yes. Who, I, who is that speaking? It's that Peter. Peter? Me, I'm sorry. Yeah, hi, Peter. Um, yes. And I'd like to. Uh, uh, Direct myself to, to Commissioner Morgan. Um, I understand where you're coming from on this, um, especially because it, as Chris Fay mentioned, it is a slippery slope when we keep harking back to 12 Harrison um, because that was, a, that was a precedent and we want to stand strong in this and make sure that we don't allow such to happen again. But I do think there is something to be said for the motion that the chair has put forth, um, which does bind the applicant to a certain course of action moving forward. Um, and we are in a position to advise the, the building commissioner we're not um, on the conditions. We can, we, it's, 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 it's in the minutes and we can make recommendation to take special care and looking at the, uh, the, the hinge factor on the front wall, what, whatever it happens to be, I think everything is covered on this building. Moving beyond this building, be, moving beyond this application, we have now, uh, I can't remember the name of the special application that, uh, or the, the affidavit that, it, that was- Yeah, code come up. permit compliance, yeah. Right, so we have that document moving forward, which I think addresses these concerns adequately. I do think that it is not in our purview to require engineering reviews. I understand where the motion comes from and I admire where the motion comes from, but I, I don't think it's entirely necessary. And I, I personally would like to see this application move forward. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add to, to that, the, thank you, Peter. I'm sorry, did, I didn't cut you off, did I? Uh, I just, just just to close by saying that I, I I'd encourage Commissioner Morgan to to reconsider. Okay, yeah, and I and I would add to that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Peter, for that. And I would add that um, there are, in addition to this, you know, commission, there are these overlapping and um, interleaved, if you will, layers of control. But uh, bet between the, the building department, uh, the enforcement officer, uh, of course, the the various codes and ordinances regarding how things are built and so on. There, even as far as the reputation and skill and background of the builder themselves. So um, in addition to the more recent control such as the um, affidavit mentioned. So uh, I've personally felt, uh, I agree with, with, uh, with Peter's words there that um, I totally understand the uh, imperative to not pre create a situation where we run the risk of having another, you know, demo by slow degrees. Uh, but I, I really am not. I really don't think that um, uh, that we're we're headed down that path in this particular case. I think, you know, it's a different applicant, different um, uh, different situation. Um, Maybe there. I don't. I don't. Maybe I don't think it's wishful thinking. You know, I just don't get that particular vibe. Um, but um, that's all I can say. Uh, so, but you know, I don't know if we've convinced you. I'll just 
this is the last time I'll ask, do you have any inclination to change your mind to, to, to make it worthwhile taking another vote? Um, well, um, Chairman Richards and, yes. and, and Commissioner McNamee, I uh, appreciate your comments and I appreciate <laughs> your, 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 your logic here. I, I, and, and your and your reasoned judgment. I um, don't want anyone to think that this is something about my um, my questioning the integrity of the applicant right. or of the builder. Um, it really has nothing to do with that. We've had a, a you know ongoing discussion over the last few months about how to really get our arms around this issue of modifying a structure um, that. Um, you know the, the 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 structural integrity of which we we are uncertain of, um, and um, the the uh, reconstruction of a roof is a major uh, modification because it increases gravity loads, it increases lateral loads, it changes the dynamic of the entire structure. Mm. Architects and builders find they they can go in and they can make their um, their conceptual modifications and we can look at these types of orthographic drawings that show their concept. But when an architect tells me that they don't have a structural engineer on board helping them then looking at this or having done the full um, inspection of this structure, foundation, walls, especially when there's gonna be a roof change, I. I just don't think that it's really unreasonable at all. I can't imagine any uh, professional uh, design team uh, balking at being able to provide this information. I mean, it's something that is going to, uh, uh, especially if it, it could in, it create um, significant cost. If, uh, if any owner would want to right. feel assured that uh, un foreseen and concealed conditions, we're not going to all of a sudden bloat their budget by 20%. I mean, it's a normal design yeah. process to have that type of information. Now, you may argue that for permitting purposes, well, why do we need it to get it through an, uh, a historical commission? Well, it's because we're dealing with the historical building guys. And I think it's not unreasonable to uh, ascertain the risk of making these kind of extensive modifications up front. I don't think it's asking very much. I cannot imagine why there's so much pushback on this. And I do, I'm actually serious until we really understand what our powers are, you know, in other words, what constitutes a quorum and whether we can ask for an engineering report until we know what those, uh, those ordinances are asking of us and are allowing us to uh, ask ourselves of the applicants, then I I would actually like to see a little bit more uh, rigor applied to historical buildings that are proposing this extens this extent extensive amount of uh, alterations, uh, including major structural alterations. So I'm going to stick with my no, <laughs> and I I hope we can have some more discussion on it. I really do think it would be good to have a procedural uh, process here that tells us exactly what we should be asking for when we're looking at a historical building um, and an applicant is wanting to make this type of, uh, 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 of a change. I think it's fair. Okay, I'm just looking at the, I'm actually looking at the ordinance right now. It's a little difficult because there's the, the D card, there's the, um, hang on a second. Your section 2-102 talks about the vote. Of um, I will mention, Glenn, this is Caitlin. Um, remind you that we did bring this up with Director Port today at a, a meeting uh, with planning staff and the chair and vice chair. And he confirmed that he was reading it that four members need to make a positive vote. Yes, yes. Um, what the part I'm looking at is about the whether we can demand or uh, insist on the engineering report. Well, you know, Mr. Chair, here, here's the thing. Um, you can, of course, you can demand whatever you want to demand, even though you have no authority to do it because we're in the middle of this delay. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, you know, I'm not threatening anything. I, I'll remind some of the commissioners who've been around a while around, not as a commissioner, because most of you are newer as commissioners, 
some of you are actually new to the city of New Report, but for those who've been around the city of New Report for a while, uh, recall a number of years ago, probably maybe 15 years ago now, where there was a, uh, I believe, a modest request relative to a, a house on um, Marlborough Street. And um, there was a significant debate about what was being done and the commission, quite frankly, dug its heels in. Uh, that house no longer exists on Marlborough Street and it was a beautiful house. It was taken down at the end of the year. Um, and it was a really sad thing to see happen. And so I'm not suggesting to this commission that this builder is gonna do that with this house. I don't know what James is gonna do, but I think there's a reasonableness factor that needs to be applied to everybody. And you have an excellent architect here. You have a well-respected builder who has come in. They have not sought to totally take to the extreme as much as possible the build out of this house on this lot, rather to preserve the petite nature of it on the street. And they have worked with the commission relative to what they originally wanted to do. And I understand the chimney was in the wrong place at the first time, but they have really worked to keep this house what it is. And to quite frankly, I'm, I'm gonna say pile on from us, what Mr. Morgan is requesting is overreaching. And at some point, somebody has to draw a line. And I don't know what the applicant's gonna do, but I know that the applicant really was restrained in what he was applying to do. And um, it doesn't make sense. It does not make any sense. It's not reasonable. It doesn't make common sense. And I don't think it's good for the preservation of existing structures, of particularly small structures in the city of New Report. Well, I found the, what I was looking for. Thank you, Attorney Mead. Uh, and I appreciate what, what you're saying. I'm um, looking at uh, uh, Article 10, Building Demolition, because uh, that's what applies in this case because of the roof line trigger. Um, if, and under C, letter E, if the application for demolition is based on a claim of structural deficiency, then the applicant may be required by the commission to submit a structural report on the structure of soundness that is prepared by a licensed professional structural engineer. And I'm sure you're familiar with this because we've, you've done that uh, in other cases uh, where there was uh, significant um, demolition or the demolition had as one of its as one or the reason uh, structural deficiency. So now it's now it's like, okay, is the fact that the roof is too low a structural deficiency or is that simply a preference on the part of, you know, the builder or potential future occupants? You know, we-, well, we, didn't, we, we, a, it was, we didn't claim it was a structural deficiency. We, we've always said that the reason we needed to raise the roof is to give head height inside, which is at five five. Right. I, I understand. Um, but the rear but, wall has to be demoed. Is but, that what was said? The rear wall has to be demoed well, because it is structurally cannot withstand the work to the roof. Well, I think we don't know. And this gets back to Mr. Morgan's point. You know, that's unknown. And a lot of the other things are unknown because the builder uh, apparently is, you know, as far as he's willing to talk to us about it, is willing to wing it based on what he's done with with other similar houses, despite the fact that his own, the, you know, the architect in this case uncovered, you know, strange and surprising things when they started looking into walls. So I don't think Mr. Morgan is totally, you know, um, unreasonable. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, be, be, you know, for I think for for these reasons, and I think that uh, I, you know, I, his the last thing I think he, you know, Mr. Morgan said was like I don't I would think of a degree that why is it such a you know even um, it's possible that you know even. Uh, an investigation by Mr. Bork himself might be sufficient to say that, okay, um, you know, I've, I've removed interior walls so I can examine the framing. Here's some pictures of that. And, 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 uh, or maybe he's, he probably has got engineers that he uses on a regular basis that can be brought in to confirm that, uh, that things are okay or not okay. And at least we would know. Um, well, that's not the, so, that wasn't the motion that Mr. Morgan made. Let's be yeah. clear. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So perhaps we modified the motion. 
Um, Chairman Richards, yeah. is it possible to modify yeah, that the motion, motion was never, to incorporate both? Yeah, that was that motion was never seconded, so there is not a motion on the floor at the moment. So, Commissioner Morgan, is there is there a modification that you would suggest that is uh, tending more towards the middle between the chair's motion and yours? Oh, while you're thinking about it, Joe, let me just read you what I wrote down while you were speaking the last time, which is a proposed motion. The applicant shall provide an engineering report as to the structural changes to be made, verifying that the changes may be safely accomplished. That's kind of a simplified version of, of what you were kind of saying. It doesn't say anything specifically in there about an approved engineering firm or anything, but so I'll leave it. To, so let me, you know, turn it over to you. I feel that the there has to be an engineering report. It has to be based on a site visit and an, a, and uh, an examination of existing conditions. That's the bare minimum of what I would, and this is a, a licensed engineer, structural engineer. Um, and that, so that would, be the, that would be the minimum of my request. Um, I, I'm trying to think about what our policy would be going forward. Um, uh, relative to whether that should be a, a, an engineer that's hired directly by the architect or the applicant, or if that should be, um, I think I would be open to that. What really disturbs me is that there's not an engineer on board as part of the team and an engineer that has not done the inspection of the, of the premises. And it, it just, I, I just can't, frankly, uh, I can't really understand why that would not have happened as, as normal course of action. But um, I, I think I would be open to that if the applicant could demonstrate um, that they're interested in this particular problem relative to the project that they're, they're proposing. The, that the structure is something that is not only a, a functional part of the building, it's actually something that's historical. And that we want to limit its um, its destruction and demolition uh, as his project goes forward. I think that's, so I, I think that that would be my compromise is saying that no, the, the structural engineer is absolutely necessary in inspection of the premises and a, a conditions report is necessary relative to the proposed work, but it can be, uh, it can be part of the, um, the applicant's design team. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I can address some of this. Um, uh, who is this, uh, Mr. Brown? Scott Brown yes. Um, very early on, uh, we had a discussion about pulling over, pulling the value of pulling a demolition permit and removing all the interior walls um, so we could see what was there. Ultimately, we decided not to do that because once we do that, James's options with this project are limited because. He doesn't have, you know, you would have a completely gutted interior, interior of this house with no permit. Um, so that's the reason why we decided not to do that. Bringing a structural engineer in now uh, at a point where he or she can see very little of that framing makes zero sense. Bringing a structural engineer down the road where they can actually see what's going on makes more sense. But the, the problem here is, you know, it's just what I said, you know, uh, once we remove those interior walls, James's options with this are really limited. Uh, so that's why we did not go in that direction. If, if I, I may, any if, sense. If, if I may, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Brown. Um, is, is it possible in uh, as, as a, a a, a way of bridging this um, in this revised motion. Um, our, our obligation is to advise the building commissioner. Um, can we not advise the building commissioner according to these concerns of yours, Joe? Um, it, and it may, it may leave that to the building commissioner to determine whether or not they will press uh, the applicant to generate an engineering review. I don't think that my, my, my impression, 
and I'm one of the new guys on the block here, my impression is that that really is not our purview. It would be nice for us to have that. It would be nice to have that as part of every submission, but it's not really the, the commission's purview, um, but it is the building commissioner's purview and we're here to advise them. And I don't believe that we read the word advise in the ordinance as saying, you know, permit yes, permit no. It's, oh, it's, it's advise. Sorry, actually, Peter, according to Jared Eigerman, the author of the ordinance, the word advise here means tell. We actually tell the building commissioner. And and I think Glenn just read the part that's, of- the, That's what I'm uh, saying, though. Yeah, that's what I'm so saying. Tell, yeah, tell, tell. Tell tell the building commissioner, this is, this is what we recommend. It doesn't need to, we don't need to stop and see that review ourselves. The building commissioner should be reviewing that. So if our advice to the building commissioner is you should get an engineering review, you should require engineering review satisfactory to fulfill your obligations under the ordinance. Right. Um, but, but then they, yeah. we, we can't we can't do that official job for them. But but in the in the uh, demo delay ordinance, the language is that the historical commission may require the applicant to submit a conditions or structural engineering report to to it to itself to yeah. the HC. That's what Glenn was reading. Understood. Yeah, but we but we do want things to move forward, um, and we can trust the building commissioner hopefully to make those uh, requirements and to review properly. Really? Yeah. While you would sorry. <laughs> I, I feel like this is it's getting late and you know I'm not doing a good job of being a timekeeper but I but there's other business to talk about so well we're, I think we might be close enough that let me try let me read Chris, this Chris I, Fay would like to say something though oh, I'm sorry uh, <laughs> uh hang on I'm got lost control of my various windows here let me find my zoom window again okay Chris did did you yeah, just a couple things. One, it's getting late, and um, at some point, I'm going to have to bow out because mm -hmm. I haven't yet another stress for early day tomorrow. the 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 second thing is, I just I, I raised my hand, and then Peter said everything I wanted to say. But there there is a building commissioner, and the building commissioner's job is to make sure that, for example, the house isn't torn down. And if the house is torn down, and if, if that's what our ultimate concern may be, I don't know what it is, um, then, then, th then the city, through whatever mechanisms, has to deal with the, the violation there. And that's what we've been looking at here. I don't, we don't have the jurisdiction to go and say, uh, you guys committed a crime here or anything like that. Um, I guess the last thing I would say real quick is, if if we're going to ask for uh, an engineering report or a structural engineering report or whatever it is, or that's in the ordinance, that should be done at the beginning so that all that information is in front of us. And I, and I just feel like this one here, uh, I guess I understand uh, Joe's concerns, but I just feel like now we're sort of throwing another layer of requirement on um, that, that again, we didn't, we didn't necessarily, there's no, there's no, uh, real uh, precedent for doing this that I'm that I remember in, in my three years on the commission nearly three years on the commission that we always required a structural engineering report that's acceptable to the committee I'm not a structural engineer I know Joe's an architect and I appreciate that but I I wouldn't be able to read a structural engineering report because I would have no basis for doing that <laughs> so um, and so then we're, therefore we're taking we're ha we'd have to take Joe's word as the architect or, or anybody else that knows that just just one more quick thing back to, to the quorum thing or in this particular case this this seems to me because we're just spinning our wheels now this is a dead issue we have three people unless malcolm appears magically at this meeting or any other meeting in the future while we're in the covid world um we're this particular issue there's three people in favor one abstention and one person voting no this is we could go round and round trying to convince Joe to change his mind or me to change her mind or trying to convince Patricia to vote, but we're spinning our wheels at this point. I don't, this is becoming non-productive. Okay, well, I think while everyone was talking, I was editing a, a, a new motion. Let me first ask uh, uh, Mr. Brown and Ms. Mead on the behalf of uh, the builder, if he, I'm gonna read this proposed motion, which I think 
may has a chance of passing, uh, but let me first see if if it would be acceptable to the applicant. And that motion would be the demo delay shall be lifted on the condition that a code and permit compliance affidavit is signed and applicant provide the building commissioner with an engineering report of existing conditions by a licensed structural engineer confirming that the proposed structural changes may be safely accomplished. Is that something that you think Mr. Borak would be willing to go along with? Yes. Um, okay. Is that something that our, my fellow members on the board would be willing to go along with? Particularly initials JM. <laughs> I, would, I, I would want the report to um, not just address the existing conditions, but it, that it addresses it relative to the modifications that are proposed. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's what it means by the structure. So no, I wouldn't use the word safely. I would say that it that it uh, it it addresses the uh, proposed changes. Okay, confirming that the well then confirming that the proposed structural changes may be accomplished or maybe that's right. That okay. that, that the demolition scope as proposed uh, is 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 adequate to accommodate the. Uh, the, 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 the necessary structural changes to, to accommodate the proposed okay. design. I think I got it. Let me or read something it. like that or something like that. Yep. I, th I think I got it. I'll reread it again. I think let me just, let me just yep. remind why we're doing this. We're doing this because we're worried that when the, um, that, um, that the, that modifications to existing walls, and it's not necessarily just concealed conditions, but it's mm -hmm. modifications to existing walls, wall heights, uh, uh, relative, for example, the, ex the, the, the existing openings in the rear wall, it was already mentioned that perhaps those right. would not be sufficient to support the new roof structure. We're looking at those types of things that are really not within the purview of the, the architect to really address. We want an engineer to really review those and say, yes, this is feasible. Okay. Thank All you. right, let me reread my edited uh, thing then. Uh, the demolition delay shall be lifted on the condition that a code and permit compliance affidavit is signed and the applicant provides the building commissioner with an engineering report of existing conditions, comma, by a licensed structural engineer, comma, confirming that the proposed structural changes and scope of demolition may be accomplished. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds good. I'm good. I'm good with that. Is that, could I take that as a second, Mr. Morgan? Indeed. <laughs> okay. All right. In that case, let's do a, a take a new vote then. Uh, stand by. Starting with um, uh, Mr. Fay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. McNamee. Yes. Mr. Morgan. Yes. Ms. Pecknick, I assume you're still abstaining. Yes, I am. Okay. And I'll vote a yes. So that means uh, uh, for the uh, applicant and the attorney that the motion is carried with a, with four yeas. Um, so we can, um, and let me just say, I'll just, I'm just gonna make a slight clarification. The demolition delay, I'll just say on three Hancock Street, I should have put that in there. I think that just so we're clear, shall be lifted, etc. So uh, and Gretchen, I can, Take forward that for you since I have it all neatly typed out if that helps you. Okay, good. So, um, so uh, if those conditions, um, we will communicate with the planning board and the building commissioner, uh, attorney Mead, that um, upon those mm -hmm. that, you know, conditions being met, one of them being quite easy, actually, the, the affidavit um, that the building permit can be issued. This removes that risk that Mr. Brown described of doing a lot of interior demo and being kind of caught with, with no permit to go forward to build anything. Okay, so I hope that is a satisfactory outcome for you all. Thank you. Great, right. thank you for the extra effort to get us over the hump here. Yep, you're welcome. Um, um, Okay, there are a couple other things. I don't think any of them are particularly long, particularly, especially because one of the items that might have been a long, longer discussion on 10 Orban Street, that's the old jail property. We postponed that because we are gonna have to discuss that a little bit. Uh, so let me see if I can go th through these fairly quickly. So we're, so the 10 Orban Street update, that's, we'll do that on our next meeting. Six Hamilton Way update is very 
is very simple. To refresh your memory, that's the property. That's it's an old Gothic revival type house uh, just off uh, High Street. Uh, was part of a little mini subdivision. There was a preservation restriction on the house as part of getting approval for that. Blah blah blah. You know. Just, and uh, there was this partial, they started to do something like a deck in the back. Um, there's no action being taken on that right now. I'm in the process of reviewing the preservation restriction to see exactly if they are, they, they might not even be out of compliance with that. There's some, you know, I'm talking with Jennifer about that and reviewing the whole situation. At any event, uh, kind of a, nothing to see here, move along um, for the moment in that, uh, there's it's kind of uh, status quo, but I will be following up with that to see if we can get it off our agenda completely uh, with them either. Um, uh, well, one way or the other, but uh, I, th that was something I don't want to follow up on. I had a, some some personal crises over the past week or so that kind of in, impeded my time to spend on this. So I wasn't able to quite finish up on that. Uh, the CPC seeking NHC representative, uh, that's the, um, I want to say so badly want to say consumer product, but it's not. It's Community Preservation Committee and their uh, grant uh, system and so on. Uh, I've decided that I'll go ahead and um, uh, uh, be willing to do that function for at least this year. Uh, we have a new member. Uh, coming on to the uh, historical commission, at least I'm pretty sure we will. The, uh, we have uh, an applicant that's already been through their first hearing by the city council. Their second one is on the 25th. So at our very next meeting, we should be up to uh, uh, seven members. And if we can get, uh, I think Malcolm said he's, believe it or not, might be buying a new computer. <laughs> so maybe we can have a full participation by all seven members for our very next meeting. That's my hope and I hope we can do that. So for this year anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and be our representative on the CPC and we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, bef before, okay, the demolition delay flow chart and voting procedures. Uh, Jennifer, do you, actually not Jennifer, sorry. Caitlin, do you have the, um, that flow? Oh, you do, good for you. Um, this is the, um, uh, flow chart. In, you remember there was we had a lot of uh, head scratching and so forth about this. What does it mean to be historically significant, and and preserved, not preferred, but prefer preferably preserved, and so on, so on. We had a discussion with the planning board staff and uh, Patricia and myself, and it turns out that um, the the way we're implementing the ordinance can be clarified and simplified. And I think you all have this flow chart now. I think this will make it easier and clearer for all people concerned. And I know some of the new members like Peter and Joe were particularly trying to, you know, struggling with figuring this out. So what we're gonna do is there'll be there will be two separate votes. The first vote is very simple. Is this structure historically significant or not? Period. End of story, right? If it's not, then it, it goes, it, we have not, we're not interested. If it is, then there is a demolition plan review at the output of which is a public hearing and so on. We hear from the public, we hear from ourselves, we hear from the applicant and so on. At the end of which we take the second vote, which is, is this structure preferably, excuse me, preferably preserved or not? If it's not, you know, and there's been only a couple like that, then again, they go on their merry way. If it is, we, can you scroll down a little bit more so I can see the rest of that flow chart? Um, Caitlin, thanks. If it is preferably preserved, then um, we get to, you know, those, one of those three options, you know, there's uh, the 12 month delay is imposed, which, you know, they can either wait that out or typically, um, they uh, agreed to a demolition permit based on various conditions approved by the NHC. We just saw an example of that a few minutes ago. And finally, um, uh, the and I've, I have yet to see this in my tenure that the the applicant provides you know um, this evidence of a of an authentic effort to find a buyer that's willing to deal with whatever the structure is and, and keep it and so on and so forth. Uh, again, that's kind of a rare thing. It's usually one of the 
it's usually that that option where the applicant comes up with a revised plan that we can go along with. So this is the flowchart we'll be following. I think this will make things a lot easier. So the uh, the um, the the output of that first vote is that the structure is histor is historically significant and considered for preservation and considered for preservation. So uh, then, you know, that's when we then go into the whole review of the plans and everything. So let me just shut my mouth for a second. Any, does that, is that clear to folks or does anyone have a question on that? No, not hearing any vociferous objections on that. Okay, so I want to yeah, you can tell I'm. You can probably tell I'm speed talking here to try to wrap this up. Um, uh, the the two letters in the correspondence. Uh, forgive me, Caitlin. I haven't even had a chance to read them myself. Um, the uh, what was the? We talked about the CPC spot already. Oh, on the um, the ordinance specifically calls for uh, the officers, that's me and your vice chair, the chair and the vice chair, I should say, to be um, voted on the first meeting of the year. Um, I would like, I'm going to propose a motion, which I will ask you guys to vote on that we move that to the second meeting. We vote on uh, officers at the, the meeting on what is it, 25th or whatever it is, 28th, whatever it is. So um, I move that we take that vote at our next meeting on the 28th, is there a second for that? This is Joe, I'll second that. Okay, so can we do a real quick roll call on that? Um, it is, I see Chris's video has gone dark. I'm not sure if he's, oh, he's there. there. Okay, Chris, uh, you, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay, Mr. McNamee? Yes. Okay, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Okay, Ms. Pecknick? Yes. Okay, and, and I'm a yes. Okay, so that's carried. So we will vote on that um, uh, next time we meet, uh, chair and vice chair. And in case you were all wondering, I don't, don't know if you were or not, I will stand for re-election if you guys choose. And uh, are, you, are you standing for re-election, re Patricia? That's so to speak, I suppose, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. Unless somebody else. Unless somebody else. Okay, up. well, we can talk about that next next time we meet. Um, Caitlin, I literally know nothing about these two letters on the shoreline resiliency and the two. Oh, the two sixty five Water Street. How could I forget? I do know something about that, and we do. We we let me go to that first because we may need to take a vote on that. I think. Um, you might remember 265 Water Street. This was the one where they, yeah, thank you, Caitlin. They were going to do this huge dormer, and we said, no way, Jose. Uh, they have gone back, and what they've done is come up with a dormer that they can do, quote, by right. They don't need our approval for. However, we uh, imposed a demo delay. So Legally, we should we probably need to release the demo delay for the for the building commissioner to issue a permit, which um, he should be able to do because what they're proposing to do does not require our approval. So Jennifer has requested that we uh, vote to release the the, dem the demolition delay. So I'll put that in the form of a motion that the uh, historical commission uh, uh, approves the release of the demolition delay that was imposed on 265 Water Street. Does that motion have a second? Chairman Richards, before we before yes. we vote on that, uh, how is it, who, who made the determination that it was by right? Uh, the uh, zoning enforcement officer. Okay, so that's that it, it is in fact by right. It's not yeah. arbitrary. Okay. Yeah, You're right. No, definitely not. Yeah. All right, I'd, I'd second then. Okay. So the movement, uh, does everyone understand what the motion is and why we're doing this? I think you do, okay. Uh, Mr. Fay, your vote on that? I, I guess I don't have a choice, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of pro forma, but I think we should legally do it. Uh, Peter? Yes. Okay, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Uh, Ms. Pecknick? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes. So uh, we'll let Jennifer know that that has been taken care of. Um, so, Caitlin, is there anything you can say about the Shoreline Resiliency Project letter? 
Um, yep, yeah, just that this is a um, letter from MHC that you all were copied on, um, that there's no adverse effect for this shoreline resiliency project, because I guess a piece of it's in the historical district. How, uh, when do they need an answer on that, did they um, say? I checked in with um, Jordy Binding, our senior project manager, and there's nothing that you need to do, it's just sort of an FYI. All right. Oh, so, well, they don't want our opinion as to whether there's an adverse effect or not, or they do? Um, Mass Historic has said that they're, they've are they made the determination that there is no adverse oh, effect. Oh, I see, so they're, oh, okay, gotcha, I misunderstood, okay. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I will take a look at that. It sounds like, and they're usually pretty persnickety. So if they've determined that, it's I think it's going to be unlikely that that I will find something, but I will take a look. Um, and we're down to the approval of the draft minutes. Um, does anyone, did anyone have any objection or corrections or objections to the minutes that uh, Gretchen sent out? Mm, not hearing or seeing anything there. So. I'll make a motion to approve the draft minutes. Is that seconded by someone? Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Fay, your vote? Yes. Okay, Mr. McNamee? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Okay, uh, hang on a second. Ms. Ms. Pecknick? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'll vote uh, yay on that as well. So we, I uh, have approved dr the draft minutes. Thank you very much for your efforts, Gretchen. And finally, it, would someone care to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Is that seconded? Second. Joe, this is Joe. I second. Okay, <laughs> seconds by Joe, I think, and Peter. Okay, uh, Mr. Fay, your vote on that? Yes. Okay, Mr. McNamee. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ms. Pecknick. Yes. Thank you. And I will also uh, vote yes, thereby officially closing this meeting. Thank you all. We managed to finish before 10 o'clock, which is nice. Chris, thank you for sticking with us. I know you are a busy guy and have an early schedule. So thanks very much for sticking it out. And with that, we end the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Bye, folks. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night.